the skewers guess the destination. The following day Pilniak officially handed over the base to Lieutenant Ross Ailes. For this reason, the latter offered a lunch, to which he invited their Commodore, high-ranking officers, and some civilians. The dogs moved around the men. He had brought them from the rocky island to keep them at the base until the time of the new set sail. After lunch, the officers got up for a walking inspection. They wanted to see that nothing was missing. Commander of Aviation, Rodriguez, entered the ski room and discovered a shotgun. He took it in his hands and was looking it over, he laughed, shoved some cartridges into the barrel, and went out alongside the dock. The sky was clear and the biting wind was always blowing from the east. Birds were flying over the radio antenna. And particles of snow were torn from the ice barrier, falling on the damp. Boulders below. Next to the base door, the yellow dog was lying down. When he saw Commander Rodriguez leave, he got up restless. Raising his head and walking with its long thin legs it headed in the direction of their glacier, without ever lowering its head, as if it was seeing someone up there. Then the birds that flew came circling over the dog. Commander. Rodriguez raised the shotgun, rested the butt on his shoulder, close to his black beard, and aimed at the top of the glacier, precisely where the dog looked. There was a dry explosion, spreading across the confines of that transparent air, and along with it a heartbreaking howl of the dog, while he ran along the edge of the beach, heading for the barrier of eternal ice. The skewers, who a moment ago had begun to descend in a flock over there, animal continued to squawk, while they got closer and closer to its head. At the sound of the shot, everyone left the house. Captain S saw his dog lose himself in the snow and asked Rodriguez what had happened. But Rodriguez knew nothing. He had shot high, and the dog had fled as if their bullet had hit him. Someone said maybe the boom could break their eardrums of the animal. Or the surprise shot drove him mad with terror. If the birds flew over the dog, it was because they perceived their emanations of camphor which is shed from frightened animals. There. Voracious birds know that they can make it their prey. Everyone thought the dog would come back. Commander Rodriguez. Regretted having yielded to an inexplicable urge, to that desire to shoot a. Shot in Antarctica. The Commodore looked at the snow on the glacier for. A long time, where the dog had focused its eyes. He gazed at the last skewers that flew, getting lost, and then silently boarded the boat. Despite knowing that the dog would not return, he often turned his face in the direction of the Great Barrier, as his boat approached the frigate. Dear friend, here I am thinking of you. I knew it. I say it from the moment. I did not fall crushed by the ice of the glacier. If it wasn't me, it would be you. It had to be someone necessary. It was written. But no, it's not that. There was a place, a destination. And you the more courageous, the more prepared to fulfill. Today I understand it well. Since that moment, everything was decided. You had gained the lead and there would no longer be room for me. In vain would I strive, trying to follow you. Knocking on the doors of ice which do not open. The one who sees everything, that analyzes, weighs the soul and the value of the heart, had preferred you. And I would be nothing more than a tragic annoyance and question mark. Full of doubts. Expelled, yes, from their domains. Tonight my soul remembers you and envies you. I know that I won't be able to forget you that I will carry you in memory. When on the grey island my hand reached out to caress your curly head, you were as wise as 
those dark birds who guessed fate. My hand ascended to your head as in. Homage to a king who is taller. The last moments of your form were. Fulfilled, of your hermetic symbol. Where did you come from? Did you. See childhood? Why did those white gods choose you, when you have no. Intelligence or reason? Why did they reject me? Perhaps for having. Them? There, in the hidden oasis, you will rest. They needed a dog, and. They took you. You will be an emblem and symbol, as when the lion was. Your brother's hand in paradise. At this moment, next to this seraphic light, I think of our souls, that thing. That we both are. What represents us and that sort shape, until breaking. It, yours. And I know that maybe you remembered me, my hand, when. You looked up the glacier, someone called you, and you accepted, saying. My father, why have you abandoned me? And then, take this chalice. Away from me. You thought about it with your eyes. And when the shot. Rang out, and you howled, it was shouts of pain and triumph. The birds. Were the birds of the limits, the signs of the earth, which will release your. Form, squawking with joy. Oh, dog friend, you are so better than men. Because you are purer, more god than humans. Now you leave me. And. When the time comes on the snow, howl again so that I know, and look for. Your ghost, who will guide me to the oasis. Meanwhile, in the light of tonight. Do you hear the Commodore who. Saw it? Do you hear? Edge listen to him. He says, where are the roads of my. Ship. How do I make it sail through my soul? Ah he does not know his. Own soul. But instead he knows mine. Because he knows, friend, that. Tomorrow I will go looking for you, before those terrible birds destroy your. Body, your unsorted hair. The search. I headed out early the next day. I have never been a great skier. In front of. Me stretched out the white plain. From the beginning. The sun was beating. Down on the snow. Refracting violently, decomposing in that sort of. Vibrant and luminous dust that hurts the sight. Then it consistent, milky. Mist descended. The sun did not pass through it, but the vibration of there. Light that bounced off the frozen ground did. I walked west in search of there. Opposite end of the island. The snow was hard at times, and the skis were. Getting stuck. From time to time, little cracks presented themselves. I was. Straining to see through the eyeglasses, touring everything they made it. Possible for me to see through the fog. Several times I diverted from their. Path, thinking I saw a lump, which was then a rock. I reached the edge of. The snow, where descending would lead to the beach, the same that I. Reached in previous days. Again I could see the rocks next to the surf, there. Silhouette of marine animals and the birds flying. I was considering taking. Off my skis, and going down to that place, when the fog began to fade and. The sun briefly reappeared. I was then able to take in the landscape and. Found myself on a tongue of land surrounded by the sea. In the distance. Appeared the hill of the island with its summit without snow and its sullen appearance. I thought that if I reached there I would get a broader view of the area. Looking through the binoculars I could discover it, perhaps, in some uneven terrain. I turned north and started up the smooth snowy slope. Now the cold sun was hitting the ice. The dryness of the air was taking hold. For an hour I walked until I reached the base of the mount. I was tired and perspired despite the cold and snow. The slope was steep and made it difficult with skis. I was soon fed up with this painful effort and I decided to take them off. I sat down, opened the key, loosened the shoe straps and 
nailed the skis in a visible place. I had not advanced a large stretch on there. Snow, when one of my legs broke through the icy crust on the ground and sank into a crevice, so that I hardly had time to back down, resisting there. Weight of my body on the other leg to escape from falling into the opening. I was able to continue climbing carefully, identifying the snow with their cane. I arrived at the rocky terrain. Here, among the rocks, stunted and dry. Mosses grew, burned by the cold, swayed in the icy air, as if they were sick. Hairs of those monstrous granite skulls. The devastated rocks were littered with snow and frozen manure. Higher up, the summit of the mountain was visible to me. It was a narrow and impregnable cone, for the rock was chipped and decomposed. The smallest stumble would despair into their abyss. I stopped and looked at the wide panorama, spanning the distance. On the other side of the horseshoe of water, of cellulous whiteness, there beautiful pyramidal mountain rows. Anchored in the bay, the two vessels and the houses of the base were highlighted as small black spots. Interrupting the snow blanket, the Antarctic sea stretched golden, covered with distant icebergs that sailed south. I was scrutinizing meticulously, pausing at crevices, noting visible boulders and shadows. Soon I understood how difficult my job would be, on that invariable plane, on that smooth shroud, the total mystery of a disappearance had been fulfilled. Not even the birds flew over the hollows. In the barrier the voice of their glacier continued to resonate, alone high up on this steep rock cone. Within the crevices, or in the marine area, next to the wolves and seals, I might find the dog. From the nearby summit the thick fog began to descend. And, in a few moments, soft gloom covered the space. The frozen desert was veiling his designs. The Commodore in his cabin. It is night. Outside the swift pole light crosses. Streaks shake on the pale sky. There is a man leaning over a table. Through the little window the Moving light penetrates. The Commodore looks at a sea chart and draws figures on it. In his hands he holds the compass and the square. Every now and then something murmurs, words that are not perceived. A long time has passed. About an hour. The man stands up and looks through their window. He begins to sing. When the angel passes, only some will arrive and then, ready to hunt the sails, these fathoms to girdle. He makes good use of the southern breeze. He sits down again and presses his temples, Ortelius was right, and so, was Cosmos. Ah, that Indicaplasts, that crazy genius. If I manage, to steer the ship to the east, always in that direction, maybe I can find there, river and the tree they which make contact with the other land. That other land the dog reached. I will take everyone, yes, everyone who goes with me on this ship. Especially that one. What is his name? He gets up and walks. T know these ices and I can decipher their voice, as if living within them. For centuries. Perhaps it has been so. But they do not speak of man, they say nothing, it seems they only want the dead. Ah, it is not yet known, that the aspiration of all grains says wheat and that every shape says man. But here, the bright wind, the gusts of light, the bursts of light, those swift and transparent ghosts like arrows, that cross this sky and that damage my sight. Only I see and know them. Here time has stopped and Everything is the same for millions of years, when the great fight was fought and the archangel fought against me. What do I say? Dot. Against. Him. Everything is identical. The fight is repeated. The same history. 
There, on the great barriers, on the vast snow plains, the drama continues. Therefore that light sees. They are squads of spirits. And it is not yet. Known who will win. I still have one option. I'll be back in combat soon. Dot. In this ship carried my people, some good warriors, the doctor, for example, totally on my side. But there is another who could well throw it all away, to lose. He has come. Perhaps it was impossible to avoid him. Yet oh gods, how ironic, if this time he took my side. Take the compass and the square and put them both against the beam of the night light penetrating through the porthole, by you, signs of the great measure and of the law, I hope that we fulfill the destiny and that in this territory the form is undone. I need you to navigate and to win. You are the signs of courage. The cold light hit the square, bouncing off their compass, where it described two circles in the shape of eight, the sign of infinity. And the Commodore sang, ready to hunt the sails. These fathoms to girdle. Take advantage of the breeze from the south. That makes you quick to navigate. Outside, the birds flew with a slight shudder, away toward the area of their horizon where the heart of the light was beating. In possession of my destiny. The O'Higgins Peninsula, or land of Graham, is like an umbilical cord. That hangs from the great belly of the Antarctic continent. It would not be possible to know if it is really united to the central mass, which is shaped like a gigantic plate or shield. The ice is wide and eternal, so that it can hardly be appreciated if the peninsula of O'Higgins is really a peninsula war. If it is a group of united islands by the ice, an indication of its peninsula condition could be the cordillera that follows her full length, then continuing in the same direction to the vicinity of the pole. In the west the waves of the Bransfield Strait, the Girl Lake and there, Billing Shawson Sea. To the east, the Weddell Sea and the peninsula is whipped by gales. Its exact amplitude is unknown, having been explored only at its ends. The English base of help is at its northern tip. There are other bases, North American and English, in Bahia Margarita, its southern tip. To the west the polar circle falls into the Bismarck Strait, still within the O'Higgins Peninsula and to the east, in the Weddell Sea. The great Antarctic shield mass is just beginning further south. It can thus be seen that this sector is still sub-Antarctic, still distant from the haunted mystery of the polar auroras. At the dawn of this day I felt a vague happiness, without knowing that I started their cause. Little by little I seemed to discover the reason. The ship shook and nodded, swaying in that familiar way. Below, the waves lashed. Against my window, there was no doubt, we were again moving. And now, in the exciting adventure, going through places unknown, in search of an unexplored place of which only I thought I had an indication. Without telling anyone, the Commodore had chosen that night to set sail. In Bahia Soberania the tanker was anchored. The frigate incorporated Captain S, the entire crew of the new base, and the Lieutenant Pilniak, who was coming to complete his hydrographic studies, during the polar night. The latter was on the command bridge that morning, on the gyro, peering through the glass with his vague and flushed gaze. The solar rays penetrated fractionally, illuminating his face with a waxy pallor. He did not seem like a being of our race, as if the Antarctic night had bled him, and his veins circulated streams of vapors and mists. It resembled a sick angel, with their wings stuffed, about to come off their back. The cabin door was open and the navigating officer could be seen. I saw him busy with the sextant, calculating the course. His fur collar was pulled 
up above his ears because the wind whipped. The Strait of Bransfield rocked its waves. Great icebergs came from there. South. They took strange shapes and had to be diverted several times to stop the course so as not to collide with them. They passed very close, so it was possible to admire their hermetic pigment, and its enchanted life of legend. Several hours we were sailing in this way, always with course to the southeast, toward the rocky peaks of two small islands, stained with snow. In the middle of the islands a long cloud spread. The navigating officer explained. The land of O'Higgins is in sight. It's that cloud. I think that there is error in the writings regarding the situation that occurs on this peninsula. There would be nothing strange about it, said Pons 8. These places are unknown. Only Charcot sailed within sight of those shores in 1906. 1. More hour and we began to glide between islands. We were entering into an intriguing cove. In front of us the wall appeared, the vertical ice wall of the barrier of the land of O'Higgins. Pons 8 spoke to me, we are the first. No one has ever seen this. Thousands of small icebergs, tiny chunks of ice, floated around us. They were green, pink, yellow, of all colors. They traveled, they turned, and they circled in the water, reflecting the sun in each of those facets, in its multiple vertices. They came to the ship and struck its hull, producing a melodic click. In the transparent water they came to project the great shadows of the islands, of the barrier and the ship, and even ours, affirmed. On the railing, looking at the sea, the frigate had slowed almost completely. In the bow, the second commander directed the work of the probe. Without jacket, dressed only in his officer's outfit and his hands without gloves, he announced the depth that we were reaching. His voice was advanced by an acoustic tube. On the bridge, Commander Regulier received the information transmitting it to a lieutenant, who in turn sent it to helmsman. The wheelhouse was under the command castle. Through the floor, we could hear the wheel. It resembled the string of a watch that is wound and stretched. With astonishing slowness, the frigate advanced directly towards the wall of ice. The rocky bottom could be seen in the blue transparency of the water. The cove narrowed more and more. I heard their commander say. These alleys always have a way out. It all consists of persevering, in not turning. It occurs to me that near the barrier we are going to find a gutter. In that case, we will see something extraordinary. Patagonia has gotten me used to these surprises. The frigate was now very close to the front wall. Even so we continued to advance slowly, when the second warned from the bow a dangerous pass. The commander ordered full gear back and the frigate stopped, to begin to retreat. Once again we were outside the silent inlet and still small multicolored icebergs circulated around us. From the south came other older ones, driven by an invisible current. About one of them a seal was stretching. Lying on her side, she supported herself on her fin as well as on her elbow. As we passed her neighborhood she raised her head and looked languidly. She opened her round eyes. Then she dropped her white lids and covered herself with her stalactite lashes. We were trying to move south for about an hour, but the pack ice began to emerge and large icebergs, more and more frequent, blocked our way. We gave up changing course in the direction of hope, that is, towards there, extreme north of the peninsula. As one sailed north, the land of O'Higgins went running east, in such a way that along with exploring those latitudes, it fulfilled the main requirement of the expedition. Further east no one 
could reach, unless they crossed the Strait of Hope, going to the wedding. C. Our instructions were to go as far east as possible. After a continuous navigation we got to where the English base of Hope is located, in the vicinity of the Cape of the same name. The commander ordered to change the heading south, sailing slowly again, more and more close to the coasts and barriers of the peninsula. The time kept was always clear, though a threatening wind blew over the plateaus pushing scattered clouds toward the invisible horizon. Some of the crew had gone to lunch, others preferred to stay on deck. Attentive to exploration alternatives, I was still in a command tower and observed with the twins the variations of the coast. Small fjords often appeared. The commanders were not interested in exploring them. By passing them, there was a time when the vision of the coast was completely interrupted by a flat iceberg like a table. As this iceberg moved away, a very different spectacle arose before us. We were close to their peninsula. In our sight was a grey rock, standing out as an extension from the ice barrier. Immediately above it stood a not very large hill, although covered with snow. The commander leaned over the gunwale and peered. To his side was there. Architect Julian. A little further away was the Commodore. Julian stretched out his arm and indicated the rock, there it could be. But I doubted it. Then the Commodore spoke in a low voice to the commander, and there. Commander ordered something to the officer on his left. The ship headed for the grey rock, and again, the voice of the second singing the depth. The anchor chain began to scrape the steel of the hull and the frigate. Anchored a short distance from the land of O'Higgins. We were among the first to tread and sink to an ease in that snow. Never was a human here at least for the millions of years that this place has been covered in snow and ice. The sailors and soldiers also descended, with their compasses and theolodites. On snowshoes and skis they walked through the snow and began to measure the terrain. The rock was bare and the rock was sullen. The wind was blowing strongly, sweeping from one end to the other. Some Blackbirds squawked in fear. Fellenberg leaned over with his camera. He was photographing and spent a long time studying the veins of the stones. Some sailors watched him full of curiosity, thinking that he could discover gold. The atavistic soul of the miner awakens in plain sight of the bare and arid rock. The wind forced us to return soon. The waves were ruffling even though the sky was still blue and clear. On the way back to the frigate, we came across an iceberg on which a seal was also coming. Could it be the same one from the morning? Coming in a dinghy rowing at full oar, in the bow, standing and with an emotionless expression, was Lieutenant Bilniak. He was holding a knife. He took off his coat and shirt, leaving his waist bare. In the boat the house's pet dog was barking furiously. The seal seemed not to care about all this and looked sleepy at these strange beings. How could it even imagine what was about to happen? Pilniak hopped on the iceberg, which swayed dangerously. He closed in quickly to the seal, stabbing it in the neck. He wanted to slide the blade of the knife down to cut it round, but he slipped falling flat on his face. There. Seal, surprised, let out a bellow of terror. He could not understand what was happening. At the same time, a stream of thick black blood leapt over the ice, rushing into the water and staining the torso of Pilniak as he struggled to get up. Like a madman he was on his feet again, unleashing new stabs at the seal's neck naked and covered in blood, he performed the inexplicable rite of this savage murder. His blood and that of the seal were merged into one. He was no longer a waxy angel, now he looked like a terrible and bloody god. 
the whole sea was stained with blood, and all. The ice, we enjoyed it with horror. Pilniak thus showed newcomers to this world what he knew, the only thing he had learned in a year, kill seals. But was it just this? At night, he meditated. And it seemed to me that he could not be so simply judged. A curious fate brought Pilniak to this universe. The Antarctic shroud slowly oppressed, destroying everything. That was physical, that was the product of another land and from another space. Along with the wind that wrinkled the plateaus, the voices of their spirits could be heard, of the genuine forms of these distances. They pressed on Pilniak's soul, embalmed it, bewitched it, but the body could not find the sun, the physical cells did not receive their nourishment. For such a simple and dense man, the drama was fulfilled more beyond his consciousness. And what could have been a wonderful death, capable of transporting to a new life, it is necessary that I die so he may live, in Pilniak it became fright, frenzied resistance before nowhere. No, he would not voluntarily allow himself to be overcome by the hug of the virgin of the ice. And he instinctively sought a way out, finding it in that pact, in that bloody rite. In the cold of Antarctica he bathed in the blood of their beings that inhabit it. He murdered, prolonging thus the existence of their pale vampire of himself. Blood is the liquid sun. If the sun did not appear in the sky, then Pilniak would look for it in hell. Someone was laughing. Downstairs. Poor Pilniak, you're already marked. Because you can never forget this thick and red blood, which runs in torrents on the ice. In what other place in the world will you find it mixed with this color so white? The name of the hills. It was a cloudy dawn. The sky was overcast and low. Nonetheless, there was good visibility. With two sailors I descended to land and began to climb the hill that stood behind the rock. The snow was very soft and we sank down to the waist. I was leading, opening the track. I felt the snow wetting me, I felt its consistency light and porous. I often squeezed it between my hands. I saw how it came together compact and then disappeared. Millions of years falling here and fading into the atmosphere. Rising to the mist, to descend another time like invisible bird feathers. It is salt without flavor, shroud of this world that looked back and was embalmed. She knows the secret, but she has no memory. What is saved? Around her, she does in spite of herself. Some whales, some eternal dead, must be kept under her sheet. Halfway through, we stopped to evaluate. We could see the bay covered with icebergs and the frigate in the middle of that white grey atmosphere. Shortly before the summit, the snow became scarce and the bare stone appeared. The sailors amused themselves looking at the rocks in search of the usual vein. One of them was short and stocky. He was the cook on board. He was always treated with respectful sympathy. For my part, he pretended to be a good comrade of mine. The other sailor was tall and black bearded. I had very seldom seen him on the frigate. Maybe he worked with the machines. We were looking for an easy climb to reach the top. We were circling around the summit. I was always in front, followed by the cook, who gave way and observed the ground with meticulousness while he collected colored strata stones. It was close to the top when a curious thing happened. The tall sailor, who marched in last, quickened his pace and, almost running, he overtook us to reach there. Top first. Once there he smiled as if satisfied, looking at us for a moment, and opening his arms to take a deep breath, as if he wanted to gaze at there 
cloudy horizon of Antarctica. Back on the frigate that afternoon, the Commodore sent for me. He was. On the bridge and beside him he had the commander and the two sailors. With whom I had climbed the hill in the morning. In the Commodore's face. Wandered the shadow of a smile, but the two men looked confused. The Commodore began, you must know that the hills also receive names. Here I am the one who baptizes them. I am John the Baptist of these regions. And I give the name of the first to reach its top. I couldn't help laughing. Now he understood everything. The Commodore interrogated. The chef, who reached that summit first. The cook looked with reproachful eyes at his companion, who kept his eyes downcast. He said. Do you confirm it? asked the Commodore. Of course, I replied. Then. The Commodore, addressing the tall sailor, who had not yet dared to look up, exclaimed, that hill will be called by your name. Your name is Morales. So that the hill will be called that. I baptize you in the name of Dot. His face had suddenly turned grim. But the sailor Morales dared to speak, interrupting the chief, Sir, these gentlemen did not know who got to the top first. Why don't you name the hill after you? Now I felt that. I was embarrassed and protested energetically, affirming that the first two reach the top was the Salem Rals and that the name of the hill should be his and no other. But something strange had happened in the meantime. In the Commodore's mind. Unexpectedly, he decided that the hill would not be baptized having to continue white and nameless for all eternity. Now I saw both sailors smiling, satisfied and grateful. In this way I received a lesson that I will not forget. For these seamen, there. Fact that a piece of the world bears their names is the maximum realization. That they can claim of hidden dreams. However, with the characteristic. Delicacy of the people. They prefer to modestly resign themselves rather than have to endure the idea of having acted without decency and generosity. What does that say for those that were named? I looked at the sailor and saw his smiling eyes now. It is beautiful that a hill bears our name. But what is our name? This white world has yet to reveal it. The birds of paradise. We set sail again because the lonely rock did not meet the required conditions. Only if we never find a more suitable place, would we return to build the base there. Meanwhile the expedition had made an important discovery. The long suspicion that the land of O'Higgins is misplaced in navigation charts, could be checked by our sailors. In relation to the geographical charts, the peninsula is run 15 miles northeast. There. Navigating officer would locate the exact point in the error. That morning we were sailing south again, a little more off from the shore. A curious phenomenon occurs in Antarctica, the landscape is never there. Same, even when you pass the same place several times. A concentration. Of icebergs, or a collapse of the ice barrier gives new configuration. There. Landscape is like a moving stage. The cove that we saw yesterday, does. Not exist today. The mountains that rose in the clear sky are covered by. Thick fog. With surprise we observed an unknown panorama. More or less in there. Same latitude of days ago. We discovered a strange world, populated with fantastic figures. The frigate was scuttling through enormous spans of icebergs that took on fanciful shapes, sailing in the direction opposite to ours, or remaining static, like sailboats from fairy tales. We deviated towards the coast. The icebergs did not diminish, but on the contrary they increased, giving the impression of an army determined to block our way to an invisible world. The Commodore ordered to anchor. Behind there. 
icebergs the peaks of islands seemed to rise, but nothing could be taken. For granted in this morning prone to all mirages, the commander's motor launch was lowered. The commodore, the doctor, the photographer and some officers got onto it. I also accompanied them. We were going to try to breach the icy trench through the compact ranks of those armies of icebergs. The noise of the launch's engine interrupted the stillness of their environment and the boat moved away with the bow directed towards their covered peninsula. As we approached the icebergs, we saw that they were not so close to each other. Wide roads opened between them. The main obstacle, the illusion, was being overcome. We soon found ourselves at the center of the first outposts. A superb spectacle, impossible to describe accurately, was presented to us. We were surrounded by mountains of ice that moved silently, or swayed gently to the beat of a faint breeze, or a mysterious rhythm. The ghosts were approaching in the same direction, adopting their most extraordinary silhouettes. Castles with white battlements, with their drawbridges and with the faces of warriors imprinted on their crystalline walls, stopped by our side. Fantasy sailboats they sailed leaving behind a silvery trail. In the direction of the bow of the launch an iceberg appeared. Divided by the half and joined in its upper part by colossal arcades of pink ice. We passed under this portal and the side walls gave off multicolored sparks, which seemed to vibrate. We stopped to contemplate it. The vision was unique. The light from the sky, intense and cold, penetrated the white walls and, from within, was transmuted into those vibrations of color. Someone that received it in all its original purity, later contaminating it with emotion and passion for color, like green, blue, purple, and gold. Blood, she surged from the ice walls, falling onto the water and spreading. Hues across its surface, around the arch and beyond the porous skin of their first iceberg floors, the light was decaying, on this second surface. Thousands of little golden and shiny dots were boiling, they circulated, they moved continuously, producing the changes of color, at times they were green, then light blue or pink. It was impossible to follow all her transformations and adventures with my eyes, the intense glow was blinding. But, if one had the strength and the power to do so, one would overcome this plane of color, being able to reach the immediate interior of the ice where the light again rests, becomes silent and becomes white. It is the central abode of light and cold. Everything is still the, without, vibration, but there is an accumulated point, a center of rest, static, which is consciousness, superconsciousness, and in which that melody of color is virtually found, the one that expands around the contour of the ice walls. Someone dwells in all this. Thousands of faces and shapes are created and recreated, and from that awareness of light, the music that accompanies the swaying of the icebergs is born. Something that is beyond the ear perceives this melody that trembles in the air, under the multicolored arcade, and that enraptured us, imperceptibly moistening us. Our launch continued forward. We stopped at times, or as in this case, we turned around an iceberg to ponder it to our liking. Despite the colossal dimensions that are visible, the part of the iceberg that is submerged in there water is twice as much as that which is shown. The foundations of these buildings navigate submerged, hidden from view by a green and yellow stain that, like thick oil comes off the floating walls. These icebergs, as they are carried by the polar currents to the north, decrease in size and die. One day in adverse climates, 
its death is announced by a turn of the bell, in which the lower part rises violently and the upper part plunges into there. C. It is a well-known story, life is changed into death and death into life. What was below rises and what was above descends. The day turns into night and the night turns into day. The ascent from the base of the dying iceberg is as if your soul is soaring to heaven. The noise of the motor of the launch brought us momentarily to reality. But the men scarcely looked at each other, and the little boat advanced. Unperturbed. A huge tubular iceberg appeared in front. It was like an island. As we got closer, we thought it would definitely block our way. But, suddenly, some white birds, similar to doves, rose like pieces from its surface. They spanned for a while and then squawked away to cross their center of the iceberg and get lost to sight. We were surprised. We had. Those birds disappeared. Across the iceberg it was impossible, unless we actually found ourselves in a place of enchantment. Those birds had to have flown down some invisible passageway from here. We steered the boat toward the point in the ice pack where we last saw them and we came across a narrow corridor between two icebergs. Towering walls stretched out on both sides, and to the other end the birds were still moving away. The iceberg split in two. As we slowly crossed the corridor of water we saw the blue light of a transparent sky. The cold shadow of the ice and the waves that hit its sides with a thud, made us wish to leave this dangerous path soon. The sailor in the boat gave an exclamation. Then we were all able to witness an amazing show. On the other side, the still sea was clear of icebergs, covered only by small pieces of ice. On a partly snowy lake, there birds flew in circles, squawking and dropping an impalpable dust from their wings. We were almost on top of the continent and within a bay cut to the west by two islets. It was a tiny expanse of the land of O'Higgins. The sky was clear, but a blanket of clouds descended over the peninsula that day so that its exact configuration remained veiled. As the launch approached, the sailor in the bow began to sing and Julian accompanied him. Again, as before, the birds had shown us the way to paradise. Hundreds of penguins lived on the tip. The inhabitants of paradise were they. When descending and passing through their nests of stones, we perhaps resembled those first conquerors who arrived to the pleasant islands of the South Seas and walked alongside the naked and wrapped natives, who welcomed them with flowers and dances. The penguins were in their breeding season. They remained lying in their small space of polychrome stones, warming their eggs. Our feet stumbled in that immense rock, destroying sometimes, and as always, the primitive rooms of beings. Then, the penguins would escape leaving the egg or the young. Some sailors tried to catch the chill chicks. If it was the female that brooded, for no reason. Did she leave the nest, facing the intruder, despite her fear? The male, on the other hand, fled in dismay, not daring to return to protect the shelter. The poor birds, without discrimination, trembled like children in our path. The trembling of their feathers produced a uniform movement in the great colony that inhabited the Rocky of the Lace. The expedition members had dispersed around the place to analyze it. Their spit of land was united to the mass of the peninsula down a rocky corridor. From here you could see a cove in which the icebergs were grouped and where the sea, in eddies, beat against the side of the barrier of very high walls. Above it, a mountain seemed to rise, but the veil of clouds did not allow us to see. Below was a beach of fine earth and sand mixed with chunks of snow and ice. 
in it rested a seal with spotted skin. We heard there. Sound of the onboard cornet. In the middle of the penguin colony, there. Bugler had ushered in reconciliation. Squatting down, he was playing a few bars. The birds came around him and listened enraptured. They twisted their picturesque little heads, some with chin straps, and others with red beaks, and they seemed to appreciate those sounds, in which perhaps they discovered God, or the rhythm of a glimpsed universe, dreamed in the dawn of the Antarctic night. The Papua and penguins and the Adelie. Penguins, with their eggs under the belly, on with their young, listened to this improvised concert, letting themselves be transported by the simple sounds. The waves were beating gently on the natural rocky pier at the top. When the launch left, to return through the icebergs, the choice was already made. Julian could build his house. In the evening, after lunch, I went up on deck and waited. The frigate had changed anchorage. Passing between two small islands, it had entered their bay, and was now anchored facing the lace. The floats of icebergs were to the north, overwhelmed, and even the great iceberg was slowly moving away. A gentle breeze was swaying. Crouched in my parka, I stopped. Like other times, next to the bow gun, the sky was clear and clean. But a great red and gold patch of twilight clouds was spreading on the horizon. On the peninsula, the veil still rested that prevented us from seeing above the cutting line of the barrier. I kept waiting. Then, the light began to tremble and a distant glow crossed the sky. The veil throbbed at its end and ripped to the south. Through the tearing, the swift light leaked, like a sudden breath, and all the long blanket of wispy clouds parted, breaking into crepes and threads that the wind moved gently toward the horizon. That much desired thing was happening. An immense mountain range of transparent beaks, extended over the back of the land of O'Higgins, too. Continue in tremendous undulations, united and separated by snow drifts and abysses. The peaks were of immaterial dawn and they ascended until they came across the last remnants of the torn veil and the triumphant night. Light. Purple ribbons sometimes descended the slopes and the waves of light beat against the peaks. Here are the mountains of my dream. As white and transparent as they could be shivering in the cold divine light. Within its snows would live. The heroes I'm looking for. Their peaks resembled the faces of titans, with the celestial eternity tempering. Feeling that I was living in a precise moment, I began to walk across the deck. Upon reaching the bow, I met the aviation commander, who was also watching the event. With his black beard and bare head, he turned when he felt me coming. Look, I said. Between those mountains the oasis awaits us. We have to go. He remained silent and turned towards the horizon of the sea to point out a new spectacle to me. The red clouds had mixed with the crepes torn from the veil that covered the mountains and the night wind was bringing them together, pushing all that unlikely mass towards the zenith and it was like coagulated blood. Deep and dark red, melting with gold and green to create impossible shapes and colors. At the far end of the horizon, where the sea meets the sky, caravans of icebergs traveled and gave me that ecstasy of light. They were blue, old gold. And somewhere, somewhere in that distance, a pulsed glow as if it were the isochronous hammering of the pulse of light. Twilight stretched across the sky and stretched beyond the world. Enveloped in an air that came from another universe, without being aware of myself I began to walk back and forth on the deck, with my face raised to the sky, and found myself wanting to sing. I marched, 
marched like a child, until late at night, maybe until the next day, or until beyond the day. I dreamed again of the transparent snow crystal hill. He was inside and he told me, we are waiting for you. Hurry up, lest you no longer find me. The wind of doom blows. The trees in here are falling. The rooms are empty. The ceilings are collapsing. Our enemies are closing in. We must leave. We will wander eternally through the worlds. We are prisoners of the myth. We need you. Come with us. Hurry up. Your dog has arrived. He told us that you would come. The wind, which scattered the crystal snow, hit the transparent mountain. Below was a blue lake. Construction of the base. And expedition to the wedding. The next day the work of unloading materials for the construction of their base began. From very early much was built on board. The whaling boats. Left with wood, bags of cement, barrels and long irons. Assure, Julian. Directed operations. Next to the natural dock a crane and a sheaf had been installed. They transported the heaviest materials to the construction site. The men worked with joy and loaded the sacks amid jokes and laughter. I went down to the beach with the officers and saw the Commodore and the commander working with the drill. The Commodore performed this symbolic act with an indifferent face, thinking of somewhere far away. I also spent a while devoted to work. I wanted to do something for my part. And accompanied the lieutenants to load sacks. Soon I had to take off my parka, because a pleasant heat circulated through my body. And so I worked with them until exhaustion overcame me. On the dock, Captain S. contemplated that morning the first efforts made for the construction of what would be his refuge for a year. His attitude was curious, for he did not take a single step to intervene or to help. Rather, he seemed disinterested. After a moment he boarded and did not descend ashore again. For several days they worked with an intense rhythm, until the unloading task was finished. The frigate had to return to sovereignty, to replenish material on the tanker. These trips would be repeated often, until construction was completed. I will not narrate them in detail. It is enough to say that we sailed through Bransfield with variable weather, more good than bad. I must also explain that it was not possible to work on land every day, as we were frequently hit by windstorms. The first of them we met had burst out on a glorious sunny day. The waves in the bay reached great heights and the boats could not descend. As refugees in the frigate, we watched the icebergs and the snows of the mountains flash. The wind roared, making the ship's chains and plates vibrate. From the sidelines it gave off snow dust and the plateau was beaten by a blizzard. During the navigation to Soberania, the water of the Strait of Bransfield had a brownish color, great tube-like icebergs furrowed it. Other icebergs followed in the wake of our ship, or caught us sliding in the opposite direction and forced us to change course. We also established a more intimate contact with the whales. It was the time when these appeared in the Antarctic seas. The areas most visited by the Maros, Kerguelen, and Bouvet, from the Weddell Sea region, at the other end of their O'Higgins Peninsula, they crossed to Bransfield. They were blue whales, baleen whales, and finbacks. The solitary sperm whales are occasionally seen here, who, as pilgrims, or adventurers, make these enormous journeys from its warm seas. Plankton, the food of whales, is abundant in their aforementioned areas and is mainly made up of a crustacean called krill. In Norwegian, finbacks also eat zooplankton copepods. 
it could be said that the Antarctic seas constitute an immense plankton soup for cetaceans. As we have already said, to enter the bay of the new base we had to pass between two rocky islets, stained with snow. One day we found a sleeping whale there. It drifted, stretched out in the sea like an odlisk. The frigate sounded the siren several times to wake it up. But that monster, about thirty meters long, was not moving. His ear, covered by multiple layers of fat, perceived only the dull stirring of his internal torrent, of his heavy circulation, of his deep and hot world among the ice. Are the whales the way we see them? What is their reality? Is there a reality? A grain of sand penetrates the oyster, injures it, irritates it. There. Oyster secretes a juice and that juice transforms the grain of sand into a pearl. The pearl is a wound, a pain, a disease. Perhaps reality is also like the grain of sand that reaches us, and the vision of the world, like the pearl. A subjective transformation, something that is no longer the original, but a product made by pain, emanating from ourselves. Reality itself escapes us. Both outwards and inwards. We live in an intermediate plane. It is never given to us to know what we really are. We can only transmute pain. Coming to feel it as pleasure. That is, everything is creation. Ultimately, we depend on potency, courage, and will for creation. It does not matter what exists or what is believed to exist. Neither one nor the other is apprehensible. And perhaps the latter is more accessible to us than their former. The whale has a point on its tail where it can be mortally wounded. In order for him to perceive the pain, or to know that he has been injured, there. Stimulus will have to travel many meters of thick meat, difficult distances, hidden fats and nerves. When the whale feels pain, Perhaps it happens as it happens to us when we contemplate a star whose light has had to pass through millions of years to leave us. The star may have already disappeared. Similarly, the whale's tail may be dead, but the whale does not know it yet, because the pain that comes to him is that of millions of light years away. The sun has set, in the refraction of light I still see it in the sky. Reality is beyond reality, originates in the mind, in a vibratory center, in something that cannot be reached without creating, transforming, inventing, losing oneself or becoming divine. Does the whale know this? At least I think the ice knows it. It does not seem to me that it is a matter exclusive to man, but common to creation. Making differences between animate and inanimate nature is our simplicity. In the cosmos everything is alive and sensible. The difference is one of grades and categories. The distinction is real only in the values of reason that it classifies in a whimsical and personal way. But the game is one, and damnation and deception are universal. I am going to try to explain here how the ice also plays a similar game and deceives, with an irony very similar to that of man. But first, I will say that, when we returned one day to the base under construction, we saw on there, white blanket of snow, which extends to the east, above the peninsula, two black points, similar to men, who observed our arrival. The dots moved sliding south, to disappear. It could have been a mirage, a vision produced by the powerful east wind that beats the snowy plains incessantly, but in everyone's mind an unknown was throbbing. The bay had lately been clear of ice, which was carried away by the polar currents and the wind from those places. It was easy now to anchor a short distance from the base, for more unloading of materials. One morning Fellenberg and I went ashore. After going for a while, I was 
surprised the photographer cut on some icebergs in the cove behind their base. He was photographing some edges of the ice. And this is what I want to talk about. At first, Fellenberg did not notice me. He was so deep in thought. But soon, the crunch of snow made him turn around. He had lost A's, like someone who returns from other distances. He must have taken a while to get used to it. Then he beckoned me over. He showed me exactly the points of their ice blocks that he was observing with a magnifying lens and then reproduced it in the camera of his machine. There were small pieces, angles, irregular edges. The light fell on these points and it was decomposed or refracted as in the different sections of a diamond. All the colors of the rainbow blade, combining in amazing mobility, similar to a fugue of sounds, they climbed and rouse, repeating the motif or after, passing it in different tones, up to the end of the chromatic scale. Later, they returned to the origin, in a movement of passion, or of sublime irony. And everything was wrapped in a radiant tremor, of magic and spell. The interesting thing, said Fellenberg, is that this occurs at a small point on the iceberg, in a thousandth of its space. The rest remains opaque and nothing should be known of the glorious event that, after all, does not alter the reality of its dense and cold existence. It is an illusion. Who knows I said? Watch. It has already changed. What is left now? Nothing. Is there any trace of the event? Not a particle saves there. Impression. It depends on where the light falls. And the entire iceberg, in any of its parts, may repeat the phenomenon. All the cold in different mass has the same possibility of going into ecstasy, reaching the supreme life. It is a matter of where the light hits. It is an illusion. And who directs the light? I asked. Chance? Are we so sure that there are no traces? Our eyes limited. If our heart turned to ice for an instant, and our spirit blended, we could perceive something else, who knows if a wound, an ecstasy, or an incurable pleasure. The ice goes mad at a certain point and its madness takes the supreme form of indifference and irony. The light falls, and nobody knows where or about whom. But Fellenberg was no longer paying attention. He was again running his camera. She was the heart of him. His machine saw more than he did, for he had given her a part of his soul. The best proof of this is that tomorrow he would reproduce an extraordinary flower of light. What he hadn't seen was caught by the lens. A flower of madness, love and death. In the small piece, on the sharp edge, its petals of rapid colors opened and were terrible. Green and red. The snapshot had managed to fix the moment when the red was decomposing into blue. And that transition, that doubt, was already spirit, almost non existent. It marked the line of madness, illusion, and joy. Joy of liberation, joy of comedy. Because there, at that point, the image had managed to show that everything was a farce and that the flower of ice and light did not exist, being an imitation, a simulated form, a game, with light, with the complicity and acceptance of the light. Perhaps there, ice and the light loved each other and initiated the multiple positions of that game. Death awaited them in the extreme. But in the meantime, they were creating, transforming, Look, Fellenberg, that luminous flower proves to us that ice happens as it happens to us. It also creates, it also pretends to be something different. A flower. Are you kidding yourself? I think not, if the moment of its flower really lives. At least he's as delusional as we are. The difference, said Fellenberg, is that ice is still ice. That is to say, 
he plays coldly, he remains serene in the face of his own drama. Who knows, I repeated. Later, I cannot be sure if it was the same day, we were observing a drop of water in one of the innumerable pools formed by the thaw. In that drop, thousands of microorganisms lived and stirred, taking unlikely forms. In Antarctica, life is rudimentary in appearance, and it is for the biologist. But it takes on a heroic tone, of an ignored epic. Life seeks inner subjective situations, so to speak. During the great night is rest, and only the moan of the wind and the sharp blow of the crystal blades is heard in the cold darkness. The great depths of the ocean are black, like a blind pupil. Though the little sponges sway, gently cradled as if by a late breeze. Those peaceful beings, who embed their kisses in the humid night, are spun by the eternal rolling of the waters and by the currents of the pole. Its galleries, its soft passageways, like honeycombs, house thousands of tiny beings, vermiform, thread-like, aneroid, that adhere to its corridors, or go through them to the rhythm of the ingestion of sea water. They love, they die, they fight, they live on the life of the soft sponges, they eat their rotten lobes. Like parasites, they steal their food and even breathe in the swaying liquid that fills their caves. Outside, all is peace. Rhythmic, imperceptible. Oscillations make one believe in an idyllic existence, the lines are curved. At times, to resemble tiny dreamy tree canopies. The passage of beings from salt water to fresh water lagoons is facilitated. By the similarity of temperature. When summer arrives and the icy crust. Of the sea breaks, on the beaches the pebbles are stripped, mosses and. Lichens appear, on the shells of polar limpets. And there the algae and fungi. Are born in the tangle of the moss tapestry. Amoebas move, protozoa and. Crustaceans roam in the rock pools. A tiny louse lives on the skin of their. Crabby to seal. And all these manifestations of life are exciting, as they. Struggle to remain with the tenacity and a heroism typical of the fury of. Creation. They try to assert themselves even here, in the most inhospitable. Place, where only the potential roots persist. Fellenberg discovered a rare flea in the snow, moving and jumping. Extracted from there it seemed to die and dry up. Observed under a microscope, it was like an ant with multiple limbs. Someone had the idea of putting it in a drop of water, at sea temperature, and that flea began to stir and came back to life again. The dark snows are stained by millions of these minimal beings. Life acquires an intensity proportional to its short time. Winter freezes the seas, covers the continent. A slight change in temperature will make life impossible for millions of beings. One wonders if this will to exist is so fervent and if nature really disperses its creatures here by thousands. Is it not rather that everything repeats itself and that life does not end but rests and recreates itself? That is to say, just like that flea. Once winter has arrived, the beings in the pools fall into a total sleep and no longer revive until the next thaw. They too have discovered immortality, rejuvenation. Energy is limited and so it is conserved. It's terrifying to think about it. There is also a relationship with color. Black birds tend to disappear from these seas and it is very difficult for them to reach the extreme latitudes of Antarctica. On the other hand, birds with white plumage withstand the cold. Much better. Their feathers do not absorb the rays of external light and prevent the internal heat from escaping, creating their own thermal zones. White is the color of cold. It is not known which of the two has preceded the other. Antarctica may be Antarctica because it is white. 
or vice versa. He who wants to conserve internal heat must avoid the heat of the outside world. The ice will be burning inside, in a central and unknown point. And the whales may have a hidden place where the color also reaches their intensity of white. At least there, in its layer of fat. Fat is cold, it is antipyretic, it is insensitive, it does not allow vibrations to enter or leave. Isolates. The heat of whale blood does not easily pass through the dead boundaries of their blubber. For the same reason, the seal, lying on their snow, overcome by the thousand year old fatigue that catches it as soon as it emerges from the water, does not shrink the iceberg that serves as its bed, because its epidermis is as cold as the world that is its blanket. There. Heat is stored in an interior space, reduced like a chest, and throbbing like entrails. Intelligence and will are also at work in Antarctica, it seems that they did it from the outside and very slowly. It is an external, disturbing intelligence. That is not in a hurry, that is also frozen and that observes like an eye. Without eyelids from the peaks of the veiled sky. She needs ages to change. Things. Petrels make their nests underground sometimes taking advantage of the galleries of the ice, with the torrents, with the waters and the snow. When they are flooded the babies die drowned. Sixty percent of the young perish in this way. However, every year the petrels repeat the mistake. A secular instinct, prior to their life in the ice, leads them to build inadequate housing. The petrel has not yet developed the new reflex, or the new concept. The idea, like light, does not yet reach beyond its feathers and bounces in thin air. It falls like the sun, from the sky, but he does it slowly, without passion. Nothing else has happened to the penguins. Since we have arrived at this place, they have accompanied us. Their nests are thinned or destroyed by the continuous movement of men. Many hatchlings have been unintentionally killed. But they do not leave and their colony still persists. In the rocky area, most of these birds are from the Papua and Kola families. The latter bear this name because they wear a black chin strap around the neck. The Genta penguin is the one that builds the most exquisite pebble nests and the Adelio is the most careless in these tasks. The superb and grandiose emperor penguin is not found in these sub-Antarctic latitudes. They gaze at the auroras of the Ross Sea, or weather the gales of Queen Maud's lands. For a long time we have been given to observe the love games of penguins, and their theft of eggs, chicks and pebbles from neighboring nests. But I think they should have left by now, as their young are adults and an imminent danger looms over them. The men still respect them, obeying the command is orders to leave them alone. But the time will come when they don't. After so many lonely centuries, the penguins are not convinced of the existence of man. It will be necessary to transform them into victims so that the reality of the human presence penetrates into their blood, becomes an idea or a reflection, capable of mobilizing their wills. Thus, fate, through death and destruction, fulfills the mandate imposed by a veiled intelligence. The terrible god of man will also reach these creatures, just as he wants. Reached the altars and temples of the sun, today reduced to dust and ruin. The form will be destroyed. However, everything is like that ice flower. Simulation, non existence. A hard and fine force, like a steel blade, going underground, creates multiple appearances, which only serve to cover it up, to disguise it, or perhaps to distract it. Here, in the ice, the form transmigrates, resurface, resurrect. 
he exercises for the afterlife. The flea that one day we carried on board, died and did not die, because in the water it would revive. Was he alive? Was he dead? I think neither one nor the other. First he simulated life and then he simulated death. He invented both. He recreated them. To do so much, you need will slash, and above all, a sense of humor. The flower of ice gives us the key and shows us the way. Maybe one day I'll ask Felnberg to give me a picture of that flower. The Great Plateau. The rock on which the base is built forms a wide border, joined to their continent by that thin tongue of stones, lashed by the waves and the tide. That rises from the silent cove. There is no noise of landslides and there. Icebergs come to take shelter, lazy and mute, through this rocky passageway you reach a sloping plain that is always covered with deep snow. Climbing it, a small abandoned hill is discovered. At the top of there, plain, much further back, to the south, a slender hill could be seen, which lets its shadow fall over the base. Skiing is practiced on the plain. The soldiers, the doctor, and Bons 8 descended swiftly, like moving points on the white savanna. Towards there, east a plateau of ice and snow stands out, furrowed by shadows and undulations. Towards the south, the peaks of the mountain range sometimes appear. I had gone up to scan the horizon. I found Commander Rodriguez there, who was looking to the east. Every now and then he would turn his head away. In the monotonous, vast distance, a radiance throbs, like forever. The great plateau collects this signal and projects it from its shield of ice and frost. That white light covers the entire horizon line. It seems that in those distances a different region, or perhaps the sea, extends. Commander Rodriguez shook his head, he seemed to have an idea. When it turned my gaze from him, he discovered me and was startled. Another day I surprised Major Salvatierra on that peak. He was sitting on the ice with a compass and a map on his knees. I was also staring to the east. The glow from the horizon was milky and lightning streaked across it. All the distance trembled. Then it would return to the incisive, nostalgic stillness. Then they saw me. A knowing smile spread across his face. The enchanted grotto. The little boat entered smoothly, moving with weak strokes of the oar. Through the still icebergs. On board were Felnberg, the doctor, Major. Rodriguez, Julian, Bons 8 and two sailors. They walked the inlet of still. Waters. Two seals were swimming diving under the icebergs, from time to time his nose and two round eyes poked out. The boat approached their barrier, revealing the entrance to an open cavern in the ice wall. The water formed a break there, so that to get closer you had to wait for the favorable movement of the tide. The boat was dragged to the mouth of the grotto. It could be seen that it was deep and that the water was introduced into it by a corridor through which the boat could advance. The decision was quick. A few energetic strokes of the oar propelled the boat and the movement of the surf did the rest. The men met in the inside a cavern of ice, drilled into the bowels of the glacier. At first the eyes were reluctant to see, not because of the darkness, but because of the light that penetrated level with the water, hitting the vault and the ice walls. Some small icebergs arrived, driven by the current and they were going to hit the walls of the grotto. Hundreds of stalactites hung from the ceiling that looked like the beards of a prehistoric wolf or a strange monster in whose belly the navigators were found. The light refracted from those ice tears producing new tones and greater mobility. As elsewhere, 
left ear to the disorder and the play of light were repeated, but due to the hermetic space and the fear of a possible detachment, the influence and suggestion in the spirit were far superior. The reality was altered and the deep cold dulled the mind, slowing its perceptions. As the boat progressed, it seemed to be crossing different color scales. First of all, green, then yellow, then scarlet and blue. The tips of the stalactites hung so low that the men had to bend to avoid brushing against them. They spoke slowly for fear that the sound of the voice would cause a collapse. This cave must be of fabulous sage, Julian said. Maybe not, replied their doctor in a very quiet voice. What takes a long time to form elsewhere, on ice can be achieved in days or weeks. It also perishes just as quickly. 2. Corroborate the doctor's expressions, the light traced all kinds of silhouettes and swift shapes on the walls. Faces, flowers, animals, shadows, that only lasted a moment and then disappeared giving rise to new creations. Against the unfading bottom of the ice, what was happening? In that cavern was like a symbol or a reduced image of the universe. Man thinks from his temporal vision and believes that things persist, that they last beyond the instant. The universe is a factory of symbols in transit, a play of light on a background of ice. Maybe we will find cave drawings of some remote inhabitant, of a distant ancestor of the Ice Age. Julian continued. What more cave drawings than those colors and these luminous transpositions on the walls? Cued there. Doctor. The remote inhabitant is the light. She is our ancestor. Certainly. That cavern seemed to be the distant ancestor's mansion. It was the magical enclosure of light. But from the cosmic light, uncreated, the men covered their eyes with their hands and the boat continued to advance on its own inland, propelled by the faint current. We were passing through fields of wonder, places where light was born, sown, in which flowers and spikes grew, and it was given to them to assist in its flowering and harvest. In the wide solar glades, purple and emerald lived. We were absorbed in this instantaneous event. Light is the creative will of form. It is the seed. Before the symbol. Light is the wandering traveler, the ancient of days. Here the memory of everything that once was is preserved, said there. Doctor. The atmosphere of the cavern grew more airified. Again someone spoke, in the caverns of the Ice Age you must go to the bottom, because that is where the sacred point is located, the sanctuary. Before the flood, the fingerprints of the hands without fingers, there. Footprints of monster feet, are recorded in the darkness of the end, also there. Hermetic sign. Suddenly the light went out. It became total darkness. There. Sailors wanted to stop the boat, rowing in reverse, leveraging the oars in. The water, but it was not possible and the keel hit bottom and ran aground. The noise of the water, crashing against a front wall, was clearly heard. Now, no one dared to strike a match. Little by little, from the entrance of the grotto, a weak beam advanced through the water, reaching the men. Again, perhaps an iceberg interrupted the passage of light. They were at the bottom of the grotto. The boat held its keel on pebbles of ice and green. Water hit the wall through which stalagmites rose. The clarity was projected differently, extra human, it bounced off the ice mirror and it was not possible to look. The men struggled and it seems that they managed to perceive a circle that surrounded the stalagmites, like a faint translucent space, framed by the blue veins of ice, through which flowed their immaterial blood of light. Staring further, it looked like a magical sphere. From deep within, or from far away, 
Shadows loomed. Commander. Rodriguez got as close as he could. So everyone thought they saw a sign. On the circumference. His features were precise, but maybe it would be. Erased. It was something like a map reproduced on the ice wall. An instantaneous vision, held in the glacier, or a memory caught in the cold. The vision of something remote, enormously distant, was reproduced in that sphere, a vast plain, first, furrowed by cracks, then shadows and rugged mountain tops, summits and abysses. A trickle of water was gliding down to a place where titans of ice interrupted the path. But there, thread pointed the way, it plunged under the frozen towers and reappeared. In the center of a valley, there was a great lake of calm waters, which gave off vapors. Trees grew around it and houses were built. Meadows of strange vegetation could be seen. An animal, perhaps a dog, was approaching a mountain. And inside, the image of a giant resting was drawn. All this was reflected in the final wall of the grotto. No one could be sure that this was really the case, not even if everyone interpreted the event in the same way, but Rodriguez murmured, that's the dog. There he is. Who can get there? It would have to be only a trickle of water. Or be dead. The truth is that no one believed they discovered in that vision the area where the base was being built. The route seemed to correspond to a central continent, infinitely far away. The cave has been given to us. Someone said. We have discovered your sanctuary. The men trembled. In the distance, came the ray of light. With difficulty we reached the exit of the cavern. Flight to Bay Esperanza. Commander Regulier wanted to reach the English camp at Bay Esperanza by any means. As has been explained, it is located precisely in the extreme north of the peninsula, in the strait that communicates with their Weddell Sea. In the exploration trip, the frigate got to the block of the Antarctic Pass, being blocked by the pack ice. The commander feared that the same thing would happen again. That is why he resorted to their seaplane. Rodriguez had transferred to the oil tanker on one of the periodic trips to Soberania, taking advantage of an exchange system that he, like their Commodore, had implemented, so that the tanker's crew could also get to know the new base. No one could explain why the Commodore did not solve the problem more directly, making the tanker come here. He preferred to keep it at anchor until the end of the expedition. Rodriguez transferred to the oil tanker and did not return. Commander Regula kept his idea of making his return to hope. His confessed intention was to study a way for the frigate. He contacted there tanker by telegraph and requested the arrival of the seaplane. Commander. Rodriguez agreed and we all thought we would see him again, with his curly beard and feverish eyes. It was not so. The hum of the seaplane was heard before it could be seen. Then a black dot moved on the blue and white background. It circled over the bay and swooped down on the ship, almost over the chimney. The pilot's head bowed and his hand waved. You could see the numbers painted on their wings. The seaplane dropped anchor and some small icebergs hit the keel of the floaters, as if they wanted to make sure of the real existence of that rare bird. A young aviation lieutenant, named Velasquez, disembarked on the boat. He explained that Commander Rodriguez was sending him in his place. After lunch, a regular boarded the seaplane. He was wearing his feather parka and the white silk scarf around his neck, and as he climbed in he took off his cap to put on the aviator's leather helmet. Velasquez helped him adjust a life jacket and parachute. 
with all this in addition to the seat. Straps, a regular was almost immobilized, barely managing to hold there. Camera, the naval chart and his binoculars. The pilot was in the forward. Cabin, being able to communicate with the captain by means of a telephone. The plane began to move north. He tuned and ran across the smooth surface of the sea. She flared cleanly, climbing over the lace. She did not immediately head south but circled several times, so that the commander could see the men working on the construction of the base, gesturing in the same way the sailors of the ship greeted him. They looked like stains on a slim steel strip. He reflected that this thing was his refuge in these hostile places, in these solitudes. The commander felt a slight shudder, it was the first time he had left his ship. He did not have time to ponder further, because below Antarctica loomed, and the seaplane was heading north, towards the end of the peninsula. They first flew over the continent, some sixty or seventy meters high. You could see that smooth sheet, wrinkled in places, covered with lines, like the palm of a hand. Deep crevices cut across the plateau, and it was possible to see them down to the depths of their shadowy depths. The ice rippled in the same direction as the wind. The plane descended almost to meet its spurred shadow on the plateau. A uh, regular looked back. The mountains were not visible on any side, it could be that in the north they leaned towards the wedding. The plane began to turn and soon the sea rose again. They flew over the shoreline, scouring chunks of the barrier and shadowy cliffs. To the left appeared the horizon of water with slight twilight and distant islands. Eregula recognized the eastern roadstead where they remained standing by during the frigate's incursion. He discovered low depths in the eastern part, which stood out sharply from the air. A large amount of ice accumulated and the commander saw some small islands that he could not recognize, due to the imperfect geographical representation of the coast of the quarter they were flying over. It could well be Gordon Island or Hope Island. A few more moments and the flight's course salted significantly towards the south, they began to follow the contour of the west coast of their Antarctic Canal. Towards the bow appeared the islands D. Irviland. Joinville. Countless images came to Eregula's mind. There, in Joinville, Larsen was shipwrecked. Nordensk Jold's dramatic adventure played itself out in his imagination. And Hope Bay was beginning to be seen as described in the book that narrates the expedition from 1901 to 1903. Between the two islands arose the channel known as Paso Activo, south of the Antarctic Canal, in the entrance to the Weddell Sea. It is possible to see Rosamal Island, almost completely devoid of ice, much smaller than the others, and the closed pack ice extended over the entire width of the channel, continuing in the open sea, even when it was seen from the air. They were observing some clear steps. It was a fact that the frigate could not reach this far. However, Hope Bay remained ice free. Its outline was familiar to the commander in Dewey's drawings of the Nordensk Chold expedition with its plains on the south side, the snow drift in their background, its imposing crevasses, and the superb figure of Mount Bransfield, guardian of that end of the mountain. A regular calculated their distance that separated this point from his base at about a hundred kilometers. The military might well try an overland expedition to unite the Chile base with the English one, he thought. He picked up the phone, consulting Velasquez about the possibility of anchoring. The pilot's voice sounded strange. He said he was going to fly over all of the perimeter of the bay. 
until the camp was in sight. Soon the camp appeared and some men waved their arms at the passage of the seaplane. The landing was perfect. As he freed himself from the many straps and moved his stiff legs, the captain saw a boat similar to a fishing boat approaching with three men on board. The crew of the boat came to invite them to come to the base. Erla and Velasquez spoke English. There, newcomers were very friendly. Once on the boat they explained that their bay was deep and that they could not know if the entire channel was frozen, because, from the camp, there was no possibility of making their observation. They had arrived at this place two years before, sailing in a specially conditioned ship. Since then they have not seen other human faces. They had to stay one more year in this place. All this was explained logically and with a monotonous intonation, without inflections or emotion. The pier was made up of a natural rocky area, from there to the base there was a short stretch. A shoal of rocks crossed from north to south. There, chorus of howling a pack of beautiful Labrador dogs greeted them. On their door of the base could be read, Eagle House, Post Office and No. Beer. The base had tiny windows and the snow was reaching well to above the middle of the wooden walls. One of the English explained, really the lighting is bad and it depresses us. But you must bear in mind that the climate here is the worst in all of Antarctica. When you have a five or six force wind on Greenwich Island, here the barometer indicates a storm. The interior was equally sad. It consisted of a central dining room, surrounded by outbuildings, a laboratory, radio room, kitchen, equipment, room, room for storing tools, and a storeroom for leashes and sleds. Their library was large, composed of scientific works. The laboratory had a dark room for the development of the photographs, the regional fauna and Flora were collected in test tubes and files. Two skulls of elephant seals stood out. The English were five in number, four civilians and a military radio operator. The one who ran them was called J.M. Roberts, a physician from Twyford. He replaced the real chief, who had set out on an important overland expedition to Bay Margarita at the other end of the O'Higgins Peninsula. The leader was Elliot, an explorer of the Himalayas. There, English doctor smoked his pipe and watched the foreigners indifferently. But he was impressed by the serious face of that chilling sailor, young and courteous, a human being who suddenly arrived from the ice. Yet two years in this world had practically burned his soul, almost without food feeding on the meat of the seals and drinking his blood, still warm, to drive the ice from the heart. Eregula looked at the ceiling. There were no electric lamps, only paraffin lanterns. They got up to leave. As they passed they saw the instruments for measuring coordinates and a complete series of meteorological devices. Dr. Roberts explained that a three-year stay in Antarctica offered them the possibility of conducting systematic studies. Outside the day was still open although the wind was beginning to blow. Velasquez took a few steps forward in the snow and felt that a bulge was coming on top of him, and the weight of a hairy body threw him on his back. He saw a dog overhead and felt its wet tongue and warm breath on him, tied to a chain. About a hundred meters long were the Labrador dogs. They stayed apart so that they couldn't reach each other. They lived in the snow all year round, digging holes to protect themselves from storms. They were beautiful, with soft oily fur and howled like wolves in the clear sky. Remnants of their food were visible on the snow, raw seal meat, gnawed bones. Using 
these dogs is a difficult art and science to learn. Nearby rose a headland of snow. Commander Regula climbed it too. Observe the distance with his binoculars. He was looking in the direction of Joinville Island and thinking again of Nordensk Chold. The expedition had been terrible. Divided into three groups, one of them spent a winter in there. Open. The men had to smear their bodies with the seal's fat and devour their raw meat. They looked wild and were hardly recognized when they finally reached Snow Hill. Eregula was also thinking of Pilniak. He saw him again with knife in hand, sliding on the iceberg, on top of his victim. He then tried to imagine the southeastern plateau, on the other side of their mountain range, stretching without end, by the sea. Some Englishmen were now marching through the winds, the cold, and the implant cable. Shroud of ice. He wanted to question the doctor, but he saw him so far away, with his empty, almost white eyes and his bloodless skin, so beside himself that he preferred to keep quiet, trying to perceive that clarity that pulsed as always in the veiled edge of the plateau. These men have forgotten words, a regular thought. Their expressions are dead, frozen. They can explain nothing to me outside of what I guessed on their faces. Yet how much would he give to march with those who were going over the great plateau, toward the southern light? Moon night. He had been dozing off for some time. An agonizing sense of subconscious lucidity kept me on the bunk. Suddenly someone spoke to me. I thought it would be less difficult to wake up, but it was like being out of my body and it was hard for me to return. I finally opened my eyes and saw a leaden face. I didn't recognize him at the time. The man wore a woolen cap and was covered with a black fur coat. The commander sends for you. He says come see the moon. He waits for you on the bridge. The sailor and his features were beginning to look familiar to me. On the bunk opposite the ship's accountant was sleeping. There was no one in the two bunks below. The occupants were a second lieutenant of engines and the navigating officer. The latter spent his days and nights on the bridge, next to the radar and the gyro compass. I put on my slippers and Robin started toward the tower. In the booth, under the bridge, I found the helmsman. He turned the tiller handle slightly. I said good evening to him, and he answered with a melodious intonation, without turning around. An unreal clarity descended from the bridge. Everything there was wrapped in the ghostly light of the moon. At the foot of one of his instruments stood the navigator, his head uncovered and his gaze lost. Beyond that, a strange character was wandering about. A lieutenant, or who knows, dry, tall, with blonde hair and a beardless face. He gazed through the cockpit glass, resting his hands on a spyglass that hung around his neck. He wore a very fine leather jacket and his hands were covered with feather gloves. He held a clay pipe to his lips and an imperceptible smile lit up his face. Then Commander Eregula entered, closing the door behind him. He came, dressed in his dress uniform and with his white cap. He shook my hand. Good evening. Behold the moon. The atmosphere was warm. An electric stove tempered the room. The officers of the night watch kept it on. The unreal light surrounded us, making us experience a unique sensation. I wanted to look at the sky and opened the door. I carried there warmth of the cabin with me, so I was able to stay outside for a long time. Successive layers of lunar fogs were falling from the sky. They descended on the bay covered with icebergs of all shapes and sizes. Some birds flew slowly, as if they had to struggle their way through the immaterial membrane of moonlight. As far as the eye could see, 
everything was permeated with that fantasy. The mountains were of pure legend, a region from another world. Convulsive, enveloped in effluvia, they seemed visited by the souls of the dead. The veil was torn and new layers of ash settled on the snow. Also in the distant oasis the moon would shine and its soft mystery, its enchantment, would be contemplated by eternal visitors. I looked at it, I saw it, huge, close, as no one has ever observed it. So close. It was the moon of Antarctica, the moon of the South Pole. It fell through the sky towards the sea, towards the end of the horizon, slipping in that subtle atmosphere. Pale, a little less than the ice, the moon touched us, extended its gnarled arms, crumbled into silvery ash dust, like a mummy without time and without memory. Then the bird flew across her face, and slipping into the shadow, it seemed to lose itself within her sphere. I ran my hand through my hair, as my head was white from that magnetized ash. Since ancient times, men have feared the moon, because its light produces madness. She is dead in heaven. I went back inside. Now the cold had gotten into my bones. There. Commander was no longer there. Behind his curtain he talked. He talked about the moon and things far away. And that lieutenant was still standing. Motionless, smoking his clay pipe. He was smiling with his eyes fixed on. The snows of an anxious country. The steering wheel moved with the sound of a clock ticking in the night. The navigating officer was leaning on the gyro and his face was white. It was an old man's face, aged by the moon. It happened like this. I was in the bunk. My eyelids become heavy as granite and I think I fell asleep. Suddenly skeletal arms crossed the ceiling. Through the ironwork. They were the arms of the moon. And the cabin lit. Up with an anguished beam of the deceased. The arms caught my chest. And began to pull, as if to pull me out. I resisted with all my might and. Over and over I got up, falling back onto the bunk. At last that magnetic current overcame me. And then I saw myself outside, surrounded by a powerful clarity, floating in the air. Although it was only for an instant, it seemed to me to be a ship stranded among the ice, next to the reefs of an island, but it was a ship from another time. No one was in it. Soon I began to climb, slowly at first, then faster and faster. Now the light had disappeared and the space was black. I realized that I was approaching an area. What I feared so much was soon to happen, the moon had caught me. Between its tentacles and its current dragged me towards its world. Afraid? I watched her get closer and closer until her dark circle hid the vision of everyone else. Then it was, huge as the earth, covered in shadows and craters. And I was falling at great speed. I wanted to stop. It was impossible. I resisted with my last strength, but the shadows faded into sharp light and two octopus-like tentacles enveloped me. In vain do I warn you against these viscous forces. The pressure was such that my chest seemed to explode. I would surely be swallowed up by that maelstrom. Sucked into that sulfur blue world. In that instant, when all seemed lost. Two figures busted in. They were whitened with ice hair. They spoke. Words of a strange language, and the pressure lifted. The current that. Dragged me broke in its center. I cannot remember if those beings wore. Pointed caps made of seal skins on their heads. When I opened my eyes, I was completely stretched out on my bunk and the pale rays of the moon came in through the little window. A strand of light played on the blankets with the greatest 
I sat in the chamber reading a book on explorations in the Antarctic lands. By Queen Maud. The curtain was drawn back, and a soldier with a lean. Silhouette approached to speak to me, I come from my elder Salvatera. He urges you to talk to him. He waits for you in his cabin. I got up and followed him down the hall. What would the elder one want me for? I remembered his somewhat festive expression. Of medium height, he had rather the appearance of a bourgeois and was not immediately imposing. By his appearance, but there was a vague smile on his face and his small eyes sometimes sparkled strangely. Major Salvatera was reading at a small table. He got up when he saw me. He was clad in his military cloak and his head was uncovered. He offered me a seat by the window and stood for a while, looking at me without saying a word, with both legs spread and balancing on the tips of his shoes. To avoid the insistence of that look and that smile, I began to observe their cabin. There were three bunks. Two were occupied by the aviation commander and the architect. None of them were currently on the frigate. Julian slept at the base under construction and the aviator was in sovereignty. At last the elder spoke, I have sent to look for you because I have something very important to tell you. And he smiled again. I could hardly guess where the elder wanted to go, but I don't know why my heart skipped a beat. Salvatera sat down near the table. Do you remember that we met up there, at the apex that overlooks the Great Plateau? I was trying to draw a map of that territory. I have seen something fabulous, extraordinary. Dot you will have seen it too. Is it true? What thing? I asked. I have seen a light that comes from the horizon. From the east. Have you not observed it? And the major's eyes glowed. Like embers. His entire face had transformed, taking on an unusual expression. Come on. He exclaimed. We went to the table where there was a letter drawn in Chinese ink. This is the plateau. Here are the mountains. And here. Do you know what is? Here? The sea. Understand? The sea. He was yelling. I have known it. By that light, by that clarity. It can't be very far. In this place the peninsula has to be very narrow. Two hundred. 130 kilometers, at there. Most. Because that light comes from the sea, it is the clarity of their ocean. If it were far away, it wouldn't project it with such intensity. There. Wedding. Do you realize it? No one has ever crossed here. They are. Unexplored territories. No one has seen the shores of the Weddell coming. From the shores of the Bransfield. Virgin snows, lonely regions for millions of years. And we will climb the mountains and reach the sea. What things will we see? I had closed my eyes, as a sensation of vertigo took me. Was it true what was happening? And I began to make the most absurd objections to their elder, absurd because that adventure was the one I had planned to do with the aviator. And in this instant, when it was made possible through another channel, I was beginning to object to it. The elder showed me a high precision compass, with a gold frame. It's our best guarantee, he told me. With this compass we cannot get lost. And then standing, I have sent for you because I thought of inviting you to my expedition. You will be the only civilian. Are you willing to? join us? T don't want anything else. I was going to ask you right now. My reflections are the product of enthusiasm, since already feel to be part of the company. He smiled. I knew it, he said. I have asked the Commodore for permission for you. He says that you must deliver a letter to him declaring that he has no responsibility in determining you that you 
Do it of your own free will. We will leave in a few days. We are going to set up our camp on the ice plateau. Training and acclimatization are essential. We will take three high mountain tents and we will build a hut in the snow. You must prepare a suitable gear to take to the field at your opportunity. That is it for today, and I thank you. TM the one who is grateful, Major. You do not know. He interrupted me, laughing his haunting laugh. And his eyes pierced me, fixed on their threshold. I braced myself at the door, for the ship was moving. I left their cabin. I prepare myself. One of those afternoons I retired to my cabin and wrote several letters. There. First was for the Commodore and I wrote it in the terms suggested by the Major. The others I still have, as they were returned to me by the frigates. Accountant officer. I open them now, after so many years, and read them. I have saved them. They are dated that year, and the ink is blurry. Someone entered the cabin. It was the onboard recorder. This sailor had a strange personality. He was not interested in Antarctica. Never once had he come ashore on the expedition. He never made references in his conversation to the continent we were on. That is why I was surprised to see him now, showing various knowledge. I have been told that you will be part of the expedition. I think you would not. That expedition is crazy. There are no adequate means to carry it out. There are no suitable dogs, no experienced people. The equipment is insufficient and the time cannot be worse. If you happen to be surprised by a storm with force 12, none of you will return. All of Antarctica is crisscrossed with large cracks in this near melt season. September and October are the good months. As a cabin mate I consider it my duty to warn you. Think about it, do not get carried away by your fantasies. But, if in spite of everything, I do not convince you, I beg you to make your will, and give it to me to keep it. He said the latter in that ironic tone with which he used to speak. I believed, therefore, that he should not care. But he insisted, I am the accountant of this ship and I must worry about these things. You give it to me and I keep it sealed. Write down everything you own and the name of the person to whom you leave it. The accountant was swinging on there. Bunk and was satisfied. At last he had something to do in Antarctica. That night, while the light was projected in the cabin, I remained motionless in my bunk, with my eyes open and watching. I crossed my hands on my chest and invoked the angel imprisoned in the ice, I will go down to your domain. I am going to open the doors of the oasis, which you guard. My eyelids became heavy and a lethargy took over my body. Gentle currents, pleasant at first, ran through me from head to toe. And I think I fell asleep. But in front of me a black spiral tube appeared, spinning dizzily. I could not take my eyes off this funnel, at the far end of which I saw a point of light, like the exit of a tunnel. As my sight grew accustomed to that ethereal maelstrom, an invincible force gripped my chest, pulling me out and down. I was terrified. Although I was aware of the event, I had no control over it. For a moment I seemed to see myself far away, in a deep black space. A superhuman laugh spread its echoes in that abyss. I fought, I resisted. I managed to overcome the current that dragged me, but I couldn't wake up. I was unfolded, inside my body and outside at the same time. Vibrations ran through me. It was like an internal plunger, speeding up uncontrollably. And that force was unable, in spite of everything, to project me out of the body.
since my daytime consciousness had entered. The process and, keeping me half awake, tangled the delicate cables and all. The subtle connections of the hidden event. The cause of this disaster could well be found in that terror that had dominated me. I had already experienced such a thing at other times, but today was of such magnitude that my brain seemed to explode. Luminous flowers swirled in space. There. Frozen flame approached my heart. One more second and it would all be over. Then there appeared a small metallic pot, full of water. Eagerly. Desperately, I plunged both of my hands into it and spilled the liquid on my body. The vibrations suddenly stopped. I was able to open my eyes. And I found myself on the bunk, reclined in the same position as before. Who put that metal pot in front of me? The water serpent was submerging. The tortured continent again. And only fire will give us immortality. There. Accountant had woken up in his bunk and was staring at me with round eyes. The camp. From early on, one of the whaling boats was transporting the gear. This consisted of three small tents, a sled, a radio transmitter, theodolites, skis, sleeping bags. Each explorer's wardrobe included two parkas, one maid of bearskin and the other made of feathers. The underwear was silk and wool. As is known, silk has insulating properties, conserving heat very well. Apart from the scarves and handkerchiefs, we were given a hat, also made of silk, to wear under the fur-lined helmets. I waited for the afternoon to come down. I left on board my blankets and the supply of dry food. Calculated for a period of about twenty days. Ben. Knew to come back for these things. In addition to the equipment I just. Mentioned, I had one of my own, that of my old mountain excursions, a. Thin parka, thick fabric pants, gabardine leggings, made especially for. This trip, and a pants cover, waterproof. The shoes were thick, some sizes larger than the foot, to be worn with several pairs of socks. I was later able to see that shoes so wide are extremely uncomfortable and that, after all, it is the same to wear one pair of socks as three. My old spiked shoes were the best, and I even wore rubber soled slip-on shoes with great success. The ski shoes had been loaned to me and they were tight. When I reached the plane where the camp had been set up, the military finished their installation. In the small field a contagious enthusiasm reigned. The upper part of the plane was chosen, next to a small and rocky hill, which would serve as protection against the wind. The tents were low, of the Aconcagua type. Its winds were tense and embedded in their snow. The day was covered in fog. Walking up to the rocks, I discovered the shelter built by Major Salvatera. This was a home in the snow, like an Eskimo igloo. Its walls were built of stones covered with snow, sticks were spread over them and a sturdy cloth was spread over them. The booth could go unnoticed, it resembled a natural occurrence on the plain. Sitting next to the doorway was the elder with a pencil and a map in his hands. When he saw me he beckoned to me. He seemed pleased with his shelter and invited me in. He must have gotten in on almost all fours. Inside were two bunk beds, that of the Major and that of Captain Homero. Rick Helm, the radio officer. Geography and mathematics books appeared near some paraffin lanterns. The floor had been paved in the same way as the walls, over it, another waterproof cloth was spread. Reflections and leaks of vaporous light, yellowish in color, entered through some gaps, plunging the cave into an hallucinated and sickly atmosphere. T feel at ease here, he said. At last 1 a.m. on the ground, and this word 
was used in a professional sense. We military men don't feel good on there. Water. She is for sailors, who are strange people. I do not understand that. Of staying in a nutshell on an unsafe item. At last on land. And he. Chuckled. Then the elder lined up the people at one end of the camp, he spoke to. Them, gentlemen, at this moment the life of the campaign begins. Everyone knows what our goal is by staying here. To achieve this, we will subject ourselves to an iron discipline. We will do daily ski training, under the command of Brigadier Morales. People should be collected early in their tents and those designated for preparatory scans should be in good cleft condition. A symbolic bullhorn will be heard at six in the morning. It will be heard even though no one can get out of the tents due to bad weather. Everyone will cook in turn. The kitchen is that hole. In turn, there. Water supply for the day will also be collected. The two civilians are subject to the military discipline of the camp. They will be our recruits. Nobody can go back anymore. The other civilian in the camp was a young radio operator from a station in Punta Arenas. With a wizened face he watched the spectacle. Immediately the major distributed the tents. The radio operator would occupy the first, with a lieutenant named Narvez. The sergeant and their corporal were in the second. The third corresponded to Brigadier Morales. And myself. The lieutenant was a strong and cheerful lad. The sergeant and the corporal had that sullen and rude appearance which usually hides a simple and kind soul. I will deal with Brigadier Morales later. The radio operator stared with languid, watery eyes. At the top of the rock, the transmitting device had been installed. That is where I found Captain Rickelm that night, trying to communicate with the frigate and with the oil tanker to set up a program of periodic broadcasts. He was a kind man, of fine treatment. He had blonde hair in his beard and faded blue eyes. He always smiled. That night it was not possible to establish a connection, the device limited itself to expelling all kinds of curious noises, similar to primordial babbling, in pieces of chaos. The hubbub was like a sound story from the years before the discovery of mechanics, as an imitation of those noises that must have preceded their invention of radio in the brains of its creators. The very long antenna was swaying in the wind of the Antarctic night. From the top of the rock you could see the silent cove half hidden in the mist. The milky light of there. Plateau descended on the plain, giving this night the appearance of a singular day, regardless of time. I went to the tent and, with considerable difficulty, entered it. Lying in his sleeping bag was the brigadier. At that time he was trying to light a small paraffin lamp to warm the room. He did not give any importance to my arrival. I started to undress. This was a feat that the brigadier saw from there. Comer of his eye. The small space of the tent would not have allowed two men to undress at the same time. I thought about getting into the sleeping bag with my heels and a wool vest. But the brigadier stopped me, do not do that. Strip completely. Clothes will prevent you from moving. There. Purpose of the sleeping bag is to maintain body temperature, forming a warm atmosphere that protects you. But the heat has to be produced by you, not the clothes. The jacket does not let the cold in, nor does the heat come out. The lighter, the more suitable. It is the object of the feathers with which it is filled. Like birds, I thought, and also like the blubber of whales. What strange bird or calf is this brigadier? For now stay with silk clothes, but the feet must be bare, without socks. 
he directed there. Operation meticulously. He was a rude, reddish man, the exact word is. Ruscio. He was not so young. It was noted that he wanted to show me his knowledge, but he did it with that cordial tone, as though not very sure of the comrade who has fallen to him. Before turning off the light, he pulled on his silk cap, tying it tightly under his chin. He told me, do the same. The head remains outside and must remain warm. I often think so much during sleep that my head never gets cold. What gets cold is my feet. But I obeyed him. He turned off the lamp, and the tent was completely dark. We were side by side. The space was so small that we could barely move. Outside there, wind was beginning to blow, and the canvas of the tent was flapping. On the floor there was nothing but a thin waterproof covering. Underneath was the hard ice and its constant, tenacious cold, passed through the fabric and the jacket, reaching my back, my lungs and even my bones. Felt it sharply, almost burning, without strength or power to fight it. It slowly took me over, like an irresistible pain. The lungs were still lukewarm. Animals, but before long they would be hit by the cutting edge. I moved. I tried to get on my side. The wind blew through the tent. The brigadier was not sleeping either. He began to speak. There is nothing better than words to protect man. They give us what objects can no longer give us. The words warmed us. He said, in Switzerland, I have also slept in the snow in the mountains. They are different mountains, other types of rocks, they seem more domesticated. They are not wild like ours. They have been covered with pine trees and man controls them. Even the snow seems less cold. There is a whole sophisticated and complex technique to climb. Here things are quite otherwise. It was a different man who spoke to me. With a sweet intonation he remembered his trip to Switzerland. He mixed up some French words. It seems that the shadow had transformed him. There I studied the parallel technique. It is difficult to master, especially for those who have been educated in the wedge system, skiing. With the silk cap, my head was feeling intense heat. I had to take it off. He continued. Our mountains are the most well known. They have no equals in the world. Right now I miss them. In this huge savannah, what encourages me, what drives me is there. Hope that those mountains, which we sometimes see, resemble those of ours. I think they are smaller. It is to them where we must go. My major is interested in the Weddell Sea, but I'm interested in those mountains. Me too. Morales, you and I are looking for the same thing. I exclaimed. Then the brigadier relit his lamp, for it seemed to him that the entrance to the tent had opened and the wind was blowing in. He checked the lock and then searched for something among his clothes. He seemed to have found it. Look, he told me, this is Switzerland. But there is something else I want to show you. This. And he pointed to the photograph of a woman. In the snow, wearing ski pants. She is my wife. Together we have climbed. The mountains. We both have the same love for mountains. She would have. Liked to take part in this exploration. Afterwards, the brigadier was pumping his small lamp, with which he. Intended to warm the room a little. And so it happened that night, between the light and the shadows, both talking away about things that we would forget tomorrow and trying to fight the ice bite with memories. Until faintly, amid the noise of the wind and the indecisive light of dawn, we heard the horn, as if it were the anguished cry of a frozen throat. The day 
the day was here. We washed ourselves by drawing water from a hole dug. In the snow. A boat left with the radio operator. He woke up with a high. Fever and a lung complication was feared. They transported him on a stretcher back to the barrier. It seemed to me that the man was happy to leave. Major Salvatierra stood at the entrance to his igloo, with a compass and a map. That good bourgeois had become a fanatical and willful man. Ironically, almost scornfully, he looked at the radio operator. He told me. Now there will be a space in the lieutenant's tent. You better move the. In this way, the brigadier will have more comfort. He is our guide. That morning we climbed to the edge of the plain. And the brigadier began. His ski lessons. The major and I were the students, because the lieutenant. Skied very well and the sergeant and the corporal could glide quickly down. The slope. The notions that the brigadier gave us were the rudimentary. Ones, turning, walking on soft snow, trimming the skis on the ice. Ascending an inclined plane, descending in semi-skid and breaking in a wedge. The brigadier considered that the wedge system was the most suitable for this terrain. We were surprised to see the elder repeat the same. Practice one and a hundred times falling and getting up, covered in snow. That man was no longer young, but he showed the enthusiasm and stubbornness of a boy. Beaten, bruised, he insisted that the brigadier continue to instruct him, despite his exhaustion. The brigadier was perspiring and so were we, without the intense cold being an impediment. The elder practiced until afternoon. Only then did we return to the camp. Lunch was cooked in a rustic way. Between two large stones hung there. Kettle. The meat and vegetables were canned. The food base was made up. Of chocolate and dry foods. In the afternoon there was a short rest, before. Continuing with the training sessions. The wind blew strong, without. Causing the fog to clear. Only when night fell did the explosion of white. Light come over the horizon. But it was momentary, as always, because. Immediately that unreal gloom returned. We took refuge in the tents. And that night was even worse than their previous one, because Lieutenant Narvez did not have a lamp to warm us. We were in the dark from the beginning and not even the constant joy of this officer could make us forget the terrible cold. I think I overcame the bite of the ice, which kept me on the brink of clairvoyance. And I say this because, after the first stage of despair and pain in the body, I was entering a state of lucid indifference, as if floating in a light world and perhaps even burning, in which the body was alien, like a stone. Dot 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 I could, if he wanted, abandon it forever without any emotion or anguish. But there. Inflexible will of the elder would bring me back to consciousness, his. Bugle call tore the grey dawn of a new day. Lost at sea. That afternoon the boats with materials continued to go ashore. They did. It despite the fog that made visibility only a metre away. I went down by. A rope and entered one of them. The boat carried wood. His crew was complete. Before leaving, the skipper of the boat, a sea corporal, offered his men a drink of water. Sailors call this drink the girl. We left in their direction of the pier. Wrapped in the parkas, the men went under a sky. Too cloudy to be serene. I watched the sailors row in silence, they were focused. At times it seemed to me that the boat was sailing through the air. Amidst the vapors of an imprecise world. Those sailors rode in eternity. And their movements were pointless. The bow of that boat would never. Touch a port. We had been sailing for a long time. If my calculations were. Not wrong, we should already be landing on the tip. I watched the sailors. And the corporal. 
They showed no concern, they laughed, joking. I also tried to laugh, participating in the talk of the boatman. In this way another half hour passed, and the men's faces did not change. The sea corporal kept the tiller in his hands and, from time to time, spoke almost ritual. Words, unintelligible to me. With an involuntary movement I looked at my little pocket compass. In it, I saw what I feared. We were marching in the opposite direction, rowing north instead of south. I went to the end. Do you know that we are lost? We have been going in the opposite direction for a long time. But there. Corporal laughed, affirming that that could not be, because we had started in the right direction. The other sailors confirmed. Then I showed them my compass and they argued to me that in these latitudes the compasses were of little use, since they frequently went crazy, due to the proximity of the pole. The cape was extended in a very curious way with the possibility that it was not the North Pole that attracted the needle, but the South Pole that repelled it. Admired the calm of these men, especially when I realized that they were not sure of what they were saying. I tried as a last resort to convince them, let's at least stay the course, in this way it will be easy for us to return, turning round to the south. I breathed relief when I saw that they accepted this proposal. I think this is what saved us, because suddenly the waves began to rise, giving the impression that we were no longer in the bay. Through the dense fog we glimpsed at times the shadows of some islets that later disappeared, and later, some great icebergs passed so close that the emanation of the ice reached us with its sharp breath. There, wind blew and the noise of landslides not too distant was heard between the waves and the fog. No one no longer doubted that we were lost at sea. The corporal exclaimed, smiling, it seems your compass was right. I've been thinking the same for a long time, but what would it have gained us by saying it? We can't go back to the ship. The captain will be furious, to believe otherwise is not to know him. We better try to find the lace. In this difficult situation there, temper of these men remained firm. We were lost in Antarctica. The storm could strike at any moment. The climate and the sea were unknown to us. However, the sailors did not show concern. Nor was I afraid of the situation we were in. I only wanted, vehemently, to reach the plane of the camp where the elder was waiting for me. What happened to us in this boat for me was a serious obstacle. With a special sense of humor, the sailors told me, why even bother going back? If we die here, it makes a good story of the trip. I understood. But I kept quiet. Because it was his reason and not mine. And from that moment on, a silent struggle began between them and me. It was the fight of his myth against mine, of the myth of the sea against the myth of the mountains. I knew that. Only the elder was offering me the possibility of a compromise between his Weddell Sea and my transparent peaks. Let's go back to the ship, I insisted. Anything else will be considered by the captain as recklessness. You, Corporal, are responsible for their decisions made here. One of the sailors said, on that island, after the fog, we could spend the night. No. I yelled. That's stupid. Let's find the frigate. Remember, Corporal, don't forget the captain. By this time there, lack of this boat will have been noticed and they will be looking for us. The Corporal's fear for the captain helped me defeat him. I never thought that the petulant captain could one day become my ally. However, this time he definitely favored me. These men feared him and the sense of discipline prevailed over the feeling of destiny. The corporal preferred to 
face the anger of his superior rather than be accused of breach of duty. One more hour we rode until the very fine ears of the sailors made out. Vibrations that were imperceptible to me. It was the noise of the frigates. Engines. The corporal steered the boat in that direction. The scene of their appearance of the ship was ghostly. She emerged from the mist like a mass. That was closing in on us. Yet she was immobile and anchored. The fleeing clouds gave the impression that she was moving, its cannons and her chimneys took on colossal proportions, towering above us. It seems that the pounding of the oars was also heard on the ship, because a sailor on duty shouted and then others crowded onto the ladder on board. There. Captain approached, looking down, where were you? We got lost. Said the corporal, reluctantly. So I see. What kind of sailor? Let's see, give. This man a boat compass, so he can reach land. I saw the corporal turn. Red and look at me sideways. The captain handed him a large compass. Similar to a lamp, and ordered him to set sail immediately, since the other boats were already returning from the tip. We arrived at the dock at dusk, when the clarity began its nocturnal signals. On the plane, I said goodbye to the sailors and, carrying my bags and blankets, I ascended the snow slope to the camp. A heavy silence awaited me. The tents were closed and only Captain Rickelm received me next to the hill. He told me that the Major had ordered me to be picked up at once. Since the people rested to start at dawn to explore the plateau, I could not take part in it because of my delay. The captain tried to convey the Major's orders to me kindly, so as not to disappoint me. He did not know that worse things could happen to me on that journey. I think I even slept that night. Although it could well have been because. Under the sleeping bag I gathered several blankets to defend myself from. The ice. The failure of an exploration. The major left accompanied by the brigadier, the sergeant and the corporal. The rest of us stayed in the camp. The group of explorers climbed the slope. To continue east, along the great plateau. It was a very rough exploration. From the start, the fog almost totally intercepted visibility. Cracks appeared in the plain. The brigadier sank into one and they had to help him. By pulling the ropes, they marched in single file, avoiding dangerous features on the ground. Towards noon the wind appeared. The blizzard engulfed them. They thought to stop but as the storm was getting worse, they continued in the same direction. The elder wanted to test the precision of his compass and the mettle of his men. In the afternoon, hunger, thirst and cold were accentuated. The sergeant took a handful of snow and put it in his mouth. His eyes were sunken. A short distance from them, the mist began to swirl in whirlwinds. Then there, Corporal fell flat on his face, and began to moan. The elder approached him and hit him with his cane. Stand up! he shouted. What is there? Meaning of this? Are you not a man? The corporal overcame himself and continued marching into the evening. They returned to camp late, sad and starving. The brigadier looked puzzled, though upright. Only the elder was. Smiling, as always, his face covered by a shaggy, dirty beard. The days passed over the camp. The fog continually closed the space. Often the east wind blew the plains, preventing all activity from us. We couldn't cook, having to stay inside the tent, motionless, and without Yvonne. Having a book to read, it snowed at all hours and the ropes barely resisted. The gale. It seemed that the fabric of the tent was splitting. The wind blew. In, beating furiously. Our entertainment consisted in following the trickles. Of water that slid down the slope of the cloth. If we were to touch with our. 
finger, the water would seep out. But as it snowed, a crust of ice formed over the tent, protecting us, isolating us. During these days of forced confinement we ate dried fruits and a certain concentrate enriched with vitamins. I had personally stopped practicing the brigadier's recommendations. I would go into the sleeping bag dressed and put on as much coat as I could, going to bed with the parka and hood on. It was no longer about doing experiments, but about saving myself from freezing. I don't think even the brigadier in his lone tent would be complying with his regulations. When the cold and the wind picked up, the lieutenant and I tried to make heat by bringing our bags closer. Less than human beings. Reduced to the pure instinct of self preservation, we were driven by a strong desire to survive. Our appearance must have been equally primitive. Sometimes, when we managed to get out of the tent, we washed ourselves with a yellow water. Like urine, in the holes of the thaw. Its touch hurt the face, hair and beard. Tangled. I deduced my appearance from the others. The elder had lost several kilos in weight and his eyes were surrounded by moving shadows. Finally the wind died down and we went back to skiing. This was one of the worst times of our stay in Antarctica. Luckily there was no windstorm on a larger scale. If that had happened, who can say if any of us would have survived? The expedition and the camp were set up in the most inappropriate conditions. We had very few essentials. Nor was this the right season to risk exploring. Antarctica, further ignoring the configuration of the area. However, I endured with joy and serenity all these sufferings. Only one thing crossed the line and it infuriated me, having to cook. We spent a whole day lighting a fire that the wind put out, thus fulfilling a job for which I was not prepared and from which atavistic knowledge no longer remains in me. One day the Commodore came to visit us. We saw him arrive at the camp. Covered with his fur hat, he sat by the fire and drank a cup of tea with us. He stared at the group, distracted, tired, as if he had done this many times. Then he dropped a few words, have you seen that light? It was already late and from the distance of the plateau the white signals arrived. There. Commodore left, without turning his face. But we all had a feeling of renewed vigor. The elder took me to the top of the slope. He spoke to me, that clarity comes from the sea. It's the weather. It shines more at night than during the day. In the daytime, the fog prevents us from seeing it. We already have the experience of a day trip. The sea preserves the invisible light of day, which may be clear in those confines, and projects it at night to show us the way. We will do the next expedition at night. We will march in there. Direction of hope, until we reach the English base. It will be the last preparatory expedition before the final one. I prefer the night. I don't want to know more about the day. So I walked away and climbed the small rocky hill to one side of the camp. From there, and in clear weather, you can overlook the bay. I sat on a stone, stained with snow and manure. Close, between two rocks, a skewer gull was found. It stretched its ascetic neck and shook out its ugly grey feathers. Solitary, it was like an anchorite in these regions, aware of its power, self-centered, ugly and proud, amid hostile elements. It stretched its neck further and seemed to penetrate the mist in the direction of the invisible bay. It spread its wings and soared through the mist, toward the sea. I said to myself, there is the king of Antarctica. He is harsh and cruel, but he is self-sufficient, he is complete. He is just like ice or cold, he is beyond all thought. 
no definition reaches it. The ruler of Antarctica who is not there. Lymphatic seal, nor the sweetheart penguin. He is the cruel and stark skewer. Tonight, while we were in the tent, we heard noises. The steps of someone. Who walked stealthily would have been better. These noises had been heard at night for some time. Maybe it was the crunch the snow makes as it hardens through the plateau towards hope. The expedition to hope took place at night. The brigadier was in front, followed by the major, me, and the sergeant. I cannot explain why the lieutenant was left without participating in this expedition. We headed northeast. We marched in single file, linked by ropes and dragging our skis on the soft snow. I don't remember much about this expedition with clarity, despite being the first in which I participated. I have a fuzzy feeling of having walked for hours and hours, always to the north, with a slight incline to the east. We then turned into the Bransfield Sound and the Peninsula Barriers. There. March was monotonous, almost uninterrupted. My shoes were tight and the bearskin parka made me perspire. The impression of sweat in a climate of intense cold, in the middle of the ice, is extremely unpleasant. From the start, the fog imprisoned us and we hardly saw the one in front of the other. At first the mind was clear, attentive to the occurrences on their ground, but then, the incredible monotony, the white color of the snow, the heavy mist that enveloped us like a sack, that barely let us pass, to close. Again, the diffuse light, existing somewhere beyond that fog, which made inextinguishable signs, they were introducing us into a mental climate that was also dense, and very soon we could not distinguish the world in which we found ourselves. The brigadier advanced silently. From time to time his voice would be heard, as if he came from on high. Every half hour the elder indicated their course. Behind me I felt the sergeant breathe. Sometimes the rope squeezed my waist. It was because the major, the sergeant, or myself, had lost the rhythm of the march. It is to be understood that when walking in, this way, mired in the mist and in that ghostly world, the impressions were soon confused, becoming equally vague. If to all this is added that unique sensation of cold and heat mixed, of ice and perspiration, the fatigue that is not felt, but that is entering the bones, then it is necessary to accept that the mind cannot fix the details and that the memory of this expedition is that of a walk that could well have been made in a single point, without advancing or returning, turning all the time around the camp. One more hour of walking in that nocturnal Antarctica and perhaps we would all have begun to see visions, but the brigadier got tired of the fog and there. Major must have admitted that we were still far from hope, even though at certain moments we thought we were close enough to the English camp to discover the lights of the facilities. We return, taking the direction to our base, and while we were doing it, the elder explained to us, this expedition will be very useful when we begin the conquest of the Weddell. We will rest all week and, at their beginning of the next, we will embark on our great adventure. Nothing will remain to be known. Nothing can resist us. Until late in the morning I remained lying in the tent. All over the camp. The snow had solidified, so that there was a crust of hard, slippery ice on the surface. In the afternoon I reached the rocky outpost. The slope was snowy. I put one foot in it and slipped, falling flat on my face on sharp ice. Rubble. A deep wound on my right eyebrow covered my face with blood. With the handkerchief I staunched it. I kept climbing to the top of the hill. I sat for a moment by the ice-crushed rock, dipping my finger in the blood. 
From the wound, I traced some marks on the snow of Antarctica. I then enclosed them in a circle. Red on white, the signs will remain penetrating to the heart of the ice. They must still vibrate on those desolate glades. I went back to camp. The brigadier healed my wound. The days began to pass slowly, agonizing. We did not see the elder. He was in his cave, plotting routes and studying maps, with the compass on his knees. Every now and then there was an eccentric laugh from him. The sergeant and their corporal made some attempts to drag the loaded sled up to the plateau, but they failed. The brigadier himself must have recognized that it was a job. Superior to his strength, the sled could not go on the expedition. It was a serious setback. When we left the sled we also gave up the radio. Transmitter. Lieutenant Rickelm would remain with his instrument. He showed no regret for it. I thought I saw a good omen that the device was discarded. The mechanical sterilization of life was left behind. Perhaps fate could act. One night I returned to the level of the plane and looked at the edge. Far away the veiled and tragic light throbbed, projecting its signals onto their pale mirror of the plateau. I looked for the mountains, but the fog covered them. I thought of my oases and that the white midnight sun would shine. There, someone was waiting for me and the time was near. In a low voice, I repeated, I have finally arrived. This is how these last days passed. I picked myself up in the tent. As there, wind blew, I went back to dreaming with my eyes open. And then someone came, stepping on the crunching snow. I struggled to see and discovered the image of the master. How long that I did not see him. There he was. Now, standing by the hill. He had an air of concern and his eyes were looking at me with affection. He beckoned me to come closer and I obeyed him with great effort. It was difficult for me to get up, leave my sleeping bag and all those things that kept me warm, among them, the body. I got closer. The master extended a hand towards the ice. This burns, he said. What loneliness and so much shade. Have you looked into this crevice? And he showed me the mouth of an abyss, while he leaned down to contemplate it. I also looked and saw a deep, endless well that reached to the center of the earth. There he is. He is, he explained. There he resides. Deep down the ice glows, because ice and fire are the same thing. The frozen fire, from whose bite no one can heal, because it destroys their dense form, and eternalizes. Whoever lives there is the guardian of fire and he lives among the ice. Do you remember Dante? He must have crossed through him, until he reached this very place where you are. But high in the sky then the southern cross shone. We will not be able to see it now. Until this mist that veils it disappears. To achieve this you must fight with him, down there, or up here. Your test is coming. Will you dare to descend into this abyss in my presence? Dot. How many things would be avoided? I involuntarily pulled back and I think my body started to shake. There. Master exclaimed, I am sorry. You will not be able to avoid the ordeal that awaits you in your real life. If you lack the strength to descend within yourself, then you will have to destroy yourself externally, learning to die. Once more, you still have human time in your heart. But do not forget. The test that is coming is hard and if you fail, you will harm many, because the lives of men are mysteriously united and the adventure of one reaches all. There are invisible threads that intertwine humanity. Your triumph or your failure will have repercussions until the end of the South. He turned 
his face and looked at the white snow on which were streaks of red. These signs. Whenever they vibrate, I must come. What do you have on your forehead? He approached. In his eyes I caught a quick reflection. And he ran his hand over my wound. I felt relieved. May your luck be light. And I saw him leave, without turning his face, separating the fog with his blue atmosphere. Towards the wedding, Lieutenant Narvez would carry a hundred sticks covered in tar, to mark the route of return, driving them into the snow at intervals of a kilometer. Since the afternoon the camp was active, provisions and tools were prepared. The skis were lined with a sealskin strip to facilitate climbing. The icy slope. Those who remained gathered in front of the tents. They hailed us by raising their arms. The elder had just come out of his snow. Shedden was saying goodbye to his men. He tied himself behind their brigadier, signaling us to do the same in the corresponding order. He put me after him. Lieutenant Narvez was behind me. The first part of the journey was made through the plain. The fog enveloped us as always, although this time it was a little less dense than on previous nights. He could see the brigadier turning his head and marching the rhythm of the march. The ropes left two meters of distance between each man. It took us half an hour to ascend to the plain. The elder changed course to the south, to skirt the side of that high hill that on clear days casts its shadow over the base under construction. We started to climb new slopes. Because of the fog, we could not distinguish the mountain slope, presenting us with the first problem of orientation. We had doubts as to whether we were circling the cone of the mountain. The elder stopped to consult his compass, and the lieutenant took advantage of the stop to drive the first stake. When we started again, the stake was like a black dot, or a friendly line on the paleness of the plain. The snow was soft and it was necessary to stomp on the skis. I felt that my shoes were tighter than on previous occasions. We had ascended quite a bit and the compass was now showing us heading east. Always going up, we kept the direction. Apparently we would not change it again. In front of us appeared a plateau of successive undulations, which continued like waves of a hardened sea. Thus we walked for a long time, with the same impression of previous days, without clearly distinguishing if we were going through the land or through an imaginary world. The hooded man in front was a grey shadow. A midnight mare fumes. The pace of the walk unnerved the mind and will. The elder raised an arm and the caravan stopped again. The lieutenant shook the snow off his skis and came forward to stand beside me. I could see him well. He had snow on his beard. He asked me to take one of their tar stakes that he carried behind his back inside a kind of quiver. You have to take off your glove, he said. I did, and the cold seized my fingers. The tar was sticky and the hand went black. The lieutenant drove this new stick into the snow, just as he had been doing. Every kilometer, the wind beat my gloves, attached by a rope around the neck of the parka. Then, the elder began to distribute lemon and anise candies. I found it extravagant and it resisted accepting them, pretending that they did me no good. But the elder got angry, saying, you have to eat them. I order you. You are under my command. These candies are absolutely necessary. The brief immobility froze us, and we had to continually wave our arms and legs. The plateau continued its slope and the temperature rose. Inexplicably, suddenly an unusual phenomenon happened in Antarctica. It started to rain. The water fell thin and we were soaked. My parka was oozing, getting wetter than the others. 
he tried to breathe in the humidity of the rain, so particular in this dry and odorless air, but it was also a special rain, between steam and ice, without humidity and almost without water, like dust, or like fine and penetrating needles. We reached a summit, and the wind blew stronger and stronger. The rain stopped and we had to advance on an incline, fighting the wind. There. Temperature dropped again and the cold became unbearable, which did not prevent us from perspiring at the same time. I think we could have frozen to death without the body stopping its perspiring. A noise like glass and faint clicking was produced on top of the clothes. The rain water was freezing on the raincoats. The unreal climate of the fog, now together with the powerful wind and the cold, produced again that lucidity close to clairvoyance, which made us look at the events with indifferent serenity. As if we were also ice beings, separated from all suffering. We stopped. Again. Fatigue became effective inside, in an almost intellectual way, by deduction or reasoning, we thought that we should be tired, that it could not be otherwise. The cold prevented us from feeling physically tired, also taking away the possibility of stopping to regain strength. We stopped for a very short time. I went to take off my gloves to open my backpack and noticed that it was completely covered in frost. The rain water had frozen on the strings, on top of the gloves and the hoods of the parkas. We shook each other. The ice fell in small pieces. The lashings were so compact and hard that there was no way to untie them. Instinctively I put my hand to my face and it felt cold, like stone. The beard was a chunk of ice. Only. Then did I discover the appearance of Major Salvatierra and that of their others. They looked like ice elders, covered in stalactites from head to shoulder. I tapped my beard with my knuckles and it snapped in half, falling with the sound of glass. Then the elder spoke to us, his voice coming from his frosty lips, Can you hear the wind? Do you smell? It is the smell of the sea. It's the sea. This wind comes from far away, but maybe not so much. Because here, in Antarctica, everything reaches distances, the view the wind. And so do. We. Today we will reach the sea. I was experiencing a sharp pain in my heels and would have liked to take off my shoes for a moment. The major was again controlling the course. The plateau was always the same. Now we were on the ice and the seal skin of our skis scraped the surface. The brigadier marched very slowly, hesitantly, groping with both sticks. In this way we continued for a few hours, until the brigadier suddenly stopped, plunging his staff into the ice. A crack, he said. We stopped. The elder consulted, is it deep? Quite. A lot, the brigadier replied, as he plunged the baton down to the hilt. Can. We cross it? Continued the major. The tone of his voice was decisive. There. Brigadier turned his face away. I guessed from his gaze what was going on. Inside him. We can, he answered. Well, said the major, that's what. We're here for. And he fastened the rope around his waist. I heard there. Lieutenant start to whistle very quietly as we parted ways until the ropes. Got taut. The first to cross was the brigadier. He did it carefully, stepping as if he wanted to rise, like mountain mules, nailing a stick in front and another behind. The rift was covered in a layer of thin ice that crackled and snapped as if it were breaking apart. The elder's turn was the next. He passed quickly, inconsequential, as if he were stepping on solid ground. I followed him. I affirmed one foot and then the other. He was already over. The crack. 
The thin cloak creaked, broke apart. I plunged a cane forward. And pushed myself. I was on the other side. As the lieutenant crossed, there. Major explained, it is very difficult for a crevice to be as wide as the length of a ski. I am convinced that there is no danger in this. From that moment we found ourselves in the middle of a field of cracks. And only at the end of this desperate expedition did we come to be rid of them. The cracks surrounded us and the brigadier ordered us to change their formation. Instead of going one after the other, we lined up horizontally. We were estranged, although with loose strings between us. I still don't understand the reason for it, but each one of us was alone. For the first time in Antarctica I experienced loneliness. A loneliness that was not produced by the external, but came from within. It was a distant primordial loneliness, congenital to existence and made conscious due to the almost metaphysical fatigue that dominated us. I sensed, I realized there. Fatigue of being, in the cells, in the entrails, the bones ached, with a cold. That penetrated to the marrow. The heel tortured me like it was being cut. All around me were shadows moving without noise. Grey fog. Then. Impenetrable darkness. I did not dare to move, but slowly, hesitating in. That nightmare darkness. As we walked for hours between cracks, without. Knowing where, without seeing by our side, an invincible sense of horror took over our spirits, and an irresistible desire to throw oneself in the snow, and finally rest. I got over it with an almost alien wisdom. I ordered myself to move on. A great faintness took possession of the body, a white fatigue rose from the feet of those who refused to advance. It was the embrace of the virgin of the ice, of which Amundsen speaks, the temptation to Rest on the ice and taste that mystical embrace. I stopped for a moment. Doubt struck me suddenly. What was I doing here? What was that world? And what did it have to do with me? In a flash, the absurdity of their adventure was revealed to me and I saw myself as a child engaged in a meaningless game. Perhaps I was close to annihilating myself, to end a life. In exchange for a dream, a suggestion maintained with deceptive skill. Transforming me into a victim of my own creations. Doubt tortured me. Could I have another way? Perhaps there, there. Jubilant water. Profound eyes, big as the universe. Quickly, the heart beat again and there. Blood found its old channels. However, somewhere in my being, a pure. Consciousness was amazed at this sudden change. The doubt would no longer leave me until the end. The horror, the fog, there. Nightmare atmosphere, the cracks, the insufferable rhythm of that. Continuous march, the cold and the proximity of death had transformed. Me. I no longer owned myself. Deep down, I was in awe of this change. It happens that in extreme climates, near the pole, curious phenomena and alterations of mental states occur. A tug on the rope forced me forward. The immense field of cracks continued to surround us. I recognized some black sticks that the lieutenant had nailed down. Maybe I was retracing my steps. I heard a voice ordering us to stop and in front of us a huge crack opened, as surely I will not see. Another. It stretched out in a zigzag until it was out of sight on the plain. I. Approached and observed that it was black and deep, like the crack of my. Dream. I felt the same terror looking at it, not daring to get too close. Then. We all got together and began following the course of this crack. With their. Brigadier at the helm we went round and round. I'll never know what we did to get through it. Somehow we found ourselves on the other side. At 
least we thought so. We formed a line again. Then the brigadier hesitated. I saw him going. Slow. I could hear him breathe with interruptions, turning his face to consult the elder. Behind, the lieutenant still marched vigorously. He no longer asked me to remove the stakes from his quiver, but rather he tried to help me. We reached the edge of a slope, or perhaps a precipice, for the brigadier stopped abruptly and waited. Then the elder started screaming and laughing. He jumped on the skis and howled against the wind. Here is the sea, here is the sea. Do you smell, do you feel this wind coming? Out? It is the sea. It is my Weddell Sea. And he hit the snow with his sticks. I listened to the wind, softly I heard it. And in the middle of it, very far away. I seemed to perceive a penetrating and high-pitched howl, calling me, waiting for me. The dog howls. Could it be you, who reminds me of the oasis, that pure and great dream? Of the beginning of time? Where are you? You have been faithful, because you have come at the moment when I need you the most, to show me there. Wait are my friends, the heroes, the immortals. They send you, and you, howl, howl in the wind, in the snow. Tell them I'm coming, tell them. I'm hesitant, I'm not sure I'll find them, I'm still in doubt. I doubt your howl, for it may well be the wind that blows on the desolate plateaus. My dog, show me your yourself, appear here with your image of blonde curls, destroyed by the ferocious skewers. Are you the voice of God, or the howl of destiny? I think that if I obey you I will be wrong. I tremble. I am weak, I do not know what happens to me. A voice that is not yours tells me that the moment has not yet come, that this may not be the way. It tells me that I must abandon this last dream, that it is not by sea, nor by land, where I will find peace nor the legendary heroes, whom you serve today. Dot. Dreams, water. Howl against the wind. I have abandoned you. The lieutenant was holding my arm, pushing me forward. He was watching. Me curiously. What happened? Is something wrong with you? Nothing. Don't you feel how it howls? Can't you hear the dog? Surprise was. Reflected on his face and he let go of my arm. You too! he exclaimed. You are going crazy. It is nothing but the wind. We were descending into the abyss. We did it by edging the skis on there. Ice! Nothing could be seen below. Everything was black, shrouded in mist. The slope was almost vertical and only with the edge of the skis did we keep adhering to it. It would be enough for one to slip to drag the other. 3. The Major kept telling us that we had reached the end of their expedition and that the Weddell Sea was at the bottom of this precipice. Then the brigadier stopped. I saw in his eyes the expression of a terrified animal. Then facing the elder, it was understood that he was not willing to continue advancing. A deathly pallor covered his face. T don't see anything, he said. I don't know where we are going. I think. If we take one more step it will really be, as you say, the end of their expedition. I'm good with here. I will stay here. The elder also stopped. He hesitated for an instant. In the voice of their brigadier he discovered the germ of rebellion. Then he did something very strange. He turned to me and looked deep into my eyes, as if inquiring, wondering, so that I knew that if I supported him, if I said a single word, to follow him, he would give the order. With me at his side, he would advance, to fulfill destiny. In a flash I sensed the mystery of this adventure. The Elder was nothing more than the vehicle of my dream. He seemed to understand it too. 
But if I doubted, there would be nothing more to do. I remained silent, like a statue of salt and suffering. The elder stood up too. How tall he was, put his hands on his waist and shouted against the wind. Towards the cold spaces in the bottom of the abyss, Weddell Sea, you have beaten me. But I'll come back. We will see each other again. Thus the expedition was concluded. We never knew where we had been or how we made the return. We returned much more easily and faster than we did it on the way there. There. Tarred stakes were very useful, pointing the way. Despite this, the brigadier got lost and could not find the exact path. But the elder consulted his compass and guided us. The big crack was nowhere to be seen this time. And I don't think it was necessary to dodge it. At the top of the steep slopes, we removed the seal skin from the skis and began to glide rapidly. Because the four of us were tied up and the major and I were not good skiers, we often rolled through the snow, dragging the brigadier and the lieutenant in the fall. My feet ached more and more and I was barely supporting myself. On the skis, in order to avoid falls altogether, a change was made. Undo the formation, to continue in a group of two. The major would go with their brigadier and me with the lieutenant. The elder tied the rope across his chest, while his end was held firmly by the brigadier, who would march behind holding him every time the speed increased too much. Narvez did the same with me. In this way, when the slope dragged me and the wind cut with great force, the lieutenant braked in wedges and the rope gave a sharp tug. I was unable to keep my balance and fell against the snow. This singular race across the cloudy plains of Antarctic lasted for several hours. From time to time we would make out ahead, like a moving point. On the ice sheet, the major and the brigadier, they descended, often progressing for long stretches. Suddenly, the fog lifted. It was in a minute, maybe just seconds. Incredibly, it dissolved into the air and for the first time in many days, in such painful hours, the deep and subtle sky of the pole appeared diaphanous around. As the world was made and our eyes were given to contemplate the landscape, we were at great heights, on slopes of ice and snow. Gentle rolling hills slid back and down, convulsing peaks that we were unable to reach. The southern cross had not yet appeared in the sky, veiled by the blazes of the eastern light. Ecstatic at this miracle, grateful, we forgot there cold and misery of our bodies. We looked at the panorama that surrounded us, emerging from nowhere and from the shadows. And there, far down, and far away, on the long blue strip of the sea, between small land, wandering icebergs, we saw a little light that was blinking. It was the frigate, anchored in the bay. With great emotion we contemplated it. That was our home our refuge in this vastness, on this continent of invincible ice and mystery defended by impenetrable barriers. The last stage of the comeback was done individually. I was the last to arrive at the camp. I barely advanced, staggering and with my feet smashed. It was already dawn. Next to the bonfire, tea and brandy awaited us. I drank it in small sips. The others were there, lying on the snow. Captain Rickelm looked on them with sweetness. The elder was still smiling. He did not feel defeated. He had done his duty. I'll be back. He repeated. I walked away towards the rocky outpost and climbed the little hill. I was looking for the skewer's nest among the rocks. I found it there. It was, as always, alone. He craned his neck at my proximity. Then he ruffled his ruffled feathers and stood up. He was looking out to the seaside. He took 
flight. He was moving away towards the western islands. A point appeared. On the horizon. It was another bird from Antarctica. The skewer joined his partner and together they flew away, circling over the happy islands. My God, I thought, even the invincible loner, the hermit, the king, seeks his opposite, his defense in the solitude. The fog prevented me from seeing it earlier. Is it necessary to cover over certain facts, so that a destiny can be fulfilled? to maintain the faith and the blindness necessary to all fulfillment? What is the truth? The fog or the light? I realized that a subtle irony, a wisdom pierced with humor, was driving these last hours and was unfolding before me in perceptible symbols, but now unusable. Dressed, I laid down inside the tent and fell asleep. The scenes of there expedition passed through my soul again and I saw the plateau, there. Unfathomable cracks. Behind the major and the brigadier, and in front of the lieutenant. Someone else was with us, someone who had the wings of a bird and howled like a dog. It was a dog with wings, a snake-shaped dog. Howling inside myself, at the base of my spine. No, it was the brigadier who was howling, he howled like a pitiful animal, towards the west, where his wife came from, approaching with some ski pants in hand. Then there, Major thrust one of his battens down the brigadier's throat and he couldn't howl anymore. We all agree to kill the elder. We buried him in the snow. And on his grave we crossed his poles and his skis. The dog with skewer wings remain watching. The Commodore also came and explained. This man must be prevented from immortalizing himself, because. Covered in this way by ice he will be able to resurrect eternally. To prevent. It I will stay here and make him discover death again. I am a specialist in. These ways, because I am. I don't remember the rest of what he said. But the Commodore sat on the Major's ice grave and stood there to prevent him from being resurrected. At times I would wake up to go back to sleep. Somewhere the face of there. Master appeared. He was staring at me curiously. Then there was a great emptiness in my heart. I had lost, I was not capable. The ice rejected me. He who resides in the white darkness, in the cold fire, did not accept their combat, because he did not find me alone enough. He saw that the hopes and illusions still lingered in my heart. Love also spread its wings there. Flying towards the barren remoteness. Sweet water, distant memory, warm fingers of human blood and consoling tenderness. I forget and dream. Wheel of reincarnations. I was not worthy of the ice or the last despair. I knew it already at the start with my heart filled with messages and boreal poems, they were subjecting me to one last illusion. I began to howl, too. Howl for a long time, between tears, between ice and frost. My soul ached. My feet ached. Lieutenant Narvez shook me hard to wake me up. He brought his head close to mine. Disquiet was reflected in his eyes. Again the Bransfield. I spent that day and the next lying in the tent. The cold paralyzed me, at times I tried to get up, but the pain in my joints and feet prevented me. He had taken my shoes off, the socks were a single bloody mass, stuck to their raw flesh of the heels and ankles. At noon a boat from the frigate came and docked near the barrier. It's Occupants went up to the camp to report that they would take me aboard. They had an order from the Commodore to this effect. Only in there. Afternoon was I able to get up and go on the air. A thin mist let through there. Clear sky at times. I descended to the rocks and waited for the boat. I jumped with great difficulty over the hangover. One of the sailors helped me on board.
the captain transmitted to me the order of the head of their expedition, I should remain in the frigate to be taken to sovereignty. I protested, saying that the expedition was not over yet and that I could not abandon it right now. But the captain insisted on transferring me to my cabin, stating that I looked fine. In my cabin, I looked at myself in the mirror. The poor light showed me an unrecognizable image. No wonder the sailors looked at me curiously. The image of a sick man was reflected in the mirror. His cheekbones were taut under dirty, transparent skin, his eyes sunk behind shadows, with signs of visible pain. A shaggy beard framed that face where fear had left its mark and where the anguish and great disorientation of the present were drawn. Then the Commodore came and sat at the foot of my bunk. He stared at the pale light for a long time. On his face there was a weariness of centuries, of ages. He remained silent. Nothing could affect him any more. He had so many times seen men in similar trances. Although it could be that a surge of faith sometimes arose in his soul. And perhaps this was there. Moment, because in his eyes the light played and tears seemed to make their way. But not. It was only the light that created his fantasies. Ghosts. Of tears, ghosts of hopes. T know everything, he said. I have always known. I will always know. I'm so tired. Then he got up. Dressed in black, the light hit his chest. Then went singing down the hall. That old song of the sea and of men. The Bransfield again. The bow rises and falls. Clouds are icebergs sailing. In thin blue. Down in the sea, they accompany us, speaking their language. Of slightest clicks, with their persistent cold and difficult games. There. Whales teach us the life of the wide seas and their stream jets unite there. Horizons. The killer whales and white doves arrive as the ambassadors of recent times. The pole moves its latitudes. And the sea is already our friend, sure of having us, as it has its waves. I let my dreams get lost and my heart and soul melt into the ice. On there. Waters of the Brandsfield, I want to recover my personality as a man and open the locks to the memory. But then I discover that my soul is burned by the ice and that it is very difficult for the rise of another passion other than that of the cold, and that of losing myself amongst its icebergs and its oases. To rise again from its unfathomable and remote depths.